Jerry, your cue is video. Amidst the uncertainty of today, the unknowns of tomorrow, through the daily sacrifices you make as you play your part to flatten the curve, we stay committed to supporting you, to see each new day with promise and hope. Your goals still count, your dreams matter. Together in this, a step at a time. Britam, with you every step of the way. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to each and every one of you from wherever you're tuning in from. My name is Jerry Jomo and I will be your moderator this afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on transitioning into the new future and I hope you're well and keeping well. We have a great panel in store for you as well as some very exciting discussions. So I hope you have your pen and paper ready and are ready for this great discussions. Now in September this year, we began a four part webinar series dubbed Education Planning with Britam. And the first episode uh, in September started with focusing on parenting during COVID. Uh, during this episode, we focused more on parents, their wellness, the environment during COVID and how to go better. And we sought to help parents build resilience in the various situations uh, that they were facing and how to continue parenting confidently. Now, today we go into our second part series in this series of education planning with Britam. And today we'll be discussing transitioning to the new future. Now, in today's session, in what we want to discuss, we recognize that it's definitely been a steep learning curve for all of us, for our children, for parents, and for all of us alike. And through this challenging season, uh, we have had a unique opportunity, obviously, to spend more time together. Unfortunately, for some, not so much, not so much time uh, being able to spend time together, but definitely learn more uh, about each other. And as we adapt to what we are now calling uh, the new normal, COVID is still here. We are now even possibly discussing a second wave there's uncertainty, are children going back to school, are they not? Some of us are working from home, some of us are already back to work. There are obviously key learnings uh, that we have during this season that are going to influence how we adjust to the future with our families, with our children, with our work environments, in parenting and education as well, and how to uh, transition sustainably. So today, part of what we'll be discussing is how to sustainably transition as parents and parents uh, in, in, in the new norm, as children and parents in this new normal, in education, in career, in wellness, obviously highlight and address the various issues that may arise and affect the children and, as, and parents during the transition. How to restore hope? Because obviously all of us still need some hope to continue believing that tomorrow is going to be better how to utilize all these lessons gathered during this season uh, to build resilience, both for children and for our parents, for all of us uh, as parents. And without much further ado, I want uh, to introduce uh, my panel for this afternoon. And my first uh, panelist is Kezia Hutua. Kezia is a child therapist and life skills trainer. She also is a mentor, a PR and research expert, and a public speaker. Kezia, please say a good afternoon to our audience uh, at this moment. Kezia? Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. Thank you, Kezia. And we'll definitely be hearing a lot more uh, from Kezia as we go through uh, this session. My next panelist is Perpetua Omondi. Perpetua is a pediatric occupational therapist. 
She's also an occupational therapy expert, a mentor, and a public uh, speaker. Perpetua, please say a uh, good afternoon to our audience. Good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to be here. Thank you, Perpetua. To my next panelist, I have Reverend Steve Thuo. Reverend Steve Thuo is a pastor at Trinity uh, Chapel Roiro. He's also a mentor. He has a passion for young people and the youth. He's also been a youth worker and he's also a public speaker. Reverend Steve Thuo, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone, and a great, great delight to be here. Thank you, Reverend. And to my last but not least panelist, uh, Mr. Ted Josiah. Ted Josiah has an interesting title. He's a man mom. Uh, he's also a creative, the creative director at Joka Jok Luxury Leather. He'll, he'll be telling us something about that. He's a visionary audiovisual producer, and he's also a public speaker. Ted, uh, say good afternoon to our, our audience. Hello, good afternoon. I hope everyone's well, and I am looking forward to sharing and um, just understanding more. Asante sana. Thank you uh, to all of you. We will jump right right into our agenda for today. As I said, I hope you have your pen and paper ready. We are uh, not just on Zoom this afternoon. We are also streaming on our YouTube channel. So invite your friends and family, anyone you think will benefit from this very interesting discussion on transitioning uh, into the new future. And I want to put across some questions to my panelists. And I want to start with, of course, during this season, we've had a lot of parents say that they are surprised at how much they have learned about their children, but even about themselves. Uh, we've seen people have new talents. Some can bake, some can knit, uh, some can do very different things. We've learned more about our personalities. And even some of us have become teachers in our own households. In your opinion, and I want to start with you, Reverend Steve, in your opinion, what are some of the take home lessons or practices we as parents should strive to retain for ourselves and our children uh, beyond the season? Thank you, Jerry. Um, I, I think some things are really God given. Um, I don't think anyone knew that we could be forced to be home or with children for six months or, or more. I, I remember as a as a church originally when we were closing, we thought it was 21 days at most 30. Uh, but now it's been more than 200 days that people have been around home um, and with their children. And I know some of us are back to work or even working from home. But let me stress, what a God-given opportunity. I've seen humor from people who've said that if the doctors don't find the vaccine for COVID, parents will because of the stress of, uh, of, of being with their children. But may I suggest um, that maybe this is a joy and, um, and a great thing. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, our children's pastor said that this is one of those seasons where our children will look back and say, this is, was one time that they got to connect with their parents. And I am, I am hoping that one of the things that we continue carrying over is that continual connection. I was hanging out with a parent uh, two days ago who was telling me that he was not even present for the birth of their last born because of work. And so he had to be flown in to, to be there. But can you imagine now this connection and this time that God has given him and, uh, and, and his wife to be with their children? So I'm, I'm hoping that is, is really something that people are onto and hopefully uh, that they are going to, to, to carry over. I think there is a second thing, uh, not just the connection, but the, the intentionality of being, of being a parent and being with our, with our, with our children. Um, I, I have three children. I sh maybe I should have said that in the introduction. Um, a 10 year old, a seven year old who's going to 11 um, because she's a daughter. She has all these amazing questions and I have a last born who's, who's five years old. And one of the interesting things is to get to listen to them, to hear their questions intentionally and to answer them sincerely. Uh, because children ask these deep questions, I think because of the busyness of our life, and I, I, I spell business with a Y, so it's how our lives are busy. Because of the business of our lives, we don't get to hear what it is that, that they are asking. And my hope is that as we carry a connection over, we are also going to carry intentionality over into the transition 
and hopefully for the longest time of our lives with our children. But I'm delighted to be here and to share more. Thank you so much, Reverend Steve. I mean, excellent points are connection and intentionality. Those are definitely two major takeaways even for me uh, during this season. What about you, Ted? You are not just mom, you're also dad uh, to your daughter. What are some of those key lessons and practices that we definitely should retain uh, even as we go beyond this period? I'll, I'll tell you the funny thing. Um, I've always worked from home. So for me, this this is not a new norm. This is just another day at the office. And at any point, my daughter is free to walk into my office, my workspace. She knows I'm always right next door. And um, if she falls, she hurts herself. The first thing I'll hear is dad, dad, dad. So um, for me, this is life as usual. Um, but I'd say this, um, I, I think that... Um, Sometimes how I feel, I'm sorry, I, I hit from a very honest space, so um, it might irk some people, but sometimes what I feel is um, people um, say this thing as if children were not intended and children are a burden and that children are um, a thing that should be sent to school so that you can have your space. But when you are intentional with your children, you find that you're so much more fruitful and um, they adapt a lot easier to stressful situations such as this. Um, and also children will take up a vibe. If you want them to be at boarding school and far away and not close to you, they'll know that you don't want them close. And trust me, um, the fruit needs to be on the tree for as long as possible for it to be a nice fruit. So you must uh, always be intentional in, in not just your actions, but also loving them so that they know that actually home is a loving space. I am wanted at home. I am loved at home. I am needed at home. And this is actually my home. School isn't home so that they don't feel too much like they're missing out on life because it's also um, very possible for you to, because you're um, unintentionally pushing them off, it's, it's very possible for them to feel unwanted, unloved, uncared for. And uh, that's heartbreaking, you know, um, even as adults, when we uh, feel unwanted and unloved, we feel very painful. So just imagine the pain that a child would feel if you unintentionally push them away. No, very good points there, Ted, and, and it's quite sobering because I'd imagine there's no parent who really wants to make their child feel unwanted, you know? So yes, carrying on the intentionality so that we, these children know that we do love them. And, and yes, there are all these competing things and which is why it is very useful that we, we outline very clearly these lessons, the connection, the intentionality. And I've had intentionality repeated right there. Uh, Perpetua, what would be some of those take-home lessons uh, for, for the children and the parents during this period? For me, I would add, uh, in addition to wonderful points by Reverend Stephen to Mr. Ted, I would add that as parents, we need to keep on identifying our children's strengths and challenges. Because during the, this period, you have identified my child is good in this one, my child is having challenges in, with that one. So I would say we don't quit on that where we just identify them. But I would say first on our list should be their strengths. <laughs> Sometimes we, we, are, we, we as parents, we are quickly saying you didn't do this one right, you didn't do this one correct. But I would say we first identify their strengths. And then also add to any child or parent who has a child with special needs, the same thing applies. Keep on identifying their strengths and keep on building their strengths. Their challenges, just teach them uh, ways to maneuver their challenges. Because even us as adults, we identified our challenges during this period. You identified, oh, I said I'm a good mommy, I'm very good in teaching. And then you identified, what? This teaching is hard and it's only kindergarten. So we, we've identified many things, but we work on our strengths and I help our children work on their strengths. And also let's work on our challenges and help the children work on their challenges. No, oh, thank you for that, uh, Perpetua. And for all of us who are watching us, can, please give us in the comment section or you just keep indicating what are your, what are those take home lessons and practices you're going to be carrying forward? I've just seen Doreen saying that she's going to spending time. I've seen also Doreen tell us that the praying, you know, now she's praying more deliberately with her children. I mean, excellent practices right there. I want to end with you, Kezia. What, uh, in your opinion, are some of these uh, practices that we definitely must carry over? Uh, 
I think one thing that this season has taught us is the need to declutter, like just go back to having a clean slate, not just being busy, but actually being productive in the little or the much we set out to do. So instead of having a whole plate of to-do lists as parents, oh, I must do this, I must do this, and that's related to work, even long before you get to the family to-do list, is to sit back and also teach our children the need to sit back, evaluate, reflect, what needs to keep being done, what needs to stop, what need to reinvent. So I think a key take home for me would be declutter where you find some things are no longer working for you, no longer serve you as a family and as an individual, let it go so that we don't need another pandemic or another global crisis to get us to the point where we say, what I'm doing is enough. I, I don't need to overstretch and then at some point lose everything, lose especially my family. So I'd say for me, declutter, rest, reflect. Those are my take homes. Thank you. Wow. Declutter, rest, reflect. I think those are words that were not synonymous with most of us before COVID. Declutter and even reprioritize. What are those things that really are important and really redefining what's important? Thank you for those, Kezia. And I want to come back uh, to you, uh, Ted, and uh, you told us you work from home. So we, we are really going to utilize this opportunity to, to learn from you because some of us have had to work from home courtesy of COVID. Okay. Uh, this season definitely came with a lot of uncertainties and we had to adjust fast. There was no time to figure out, to understand what was going on. And some of us definitely went into panic mode. There was panic shopping, you know, that was all kind of panic type of, type of things. And, and the situation just continued dragging on. Uh, Reverend Steve has mentioned it was supposed to be 30 days and I'd imagine it was not just him. A lot of people imagined it would, it would end, end sooner. And just as we're beginning to adjust yet again, uh, something else comes up. We now possibly have another COVID wave and, and, and all of that. So of, of course, this continues to cause certain anxieties uh, to us even right now. So what are some yeah. of the anxieties that parents could possibly still be dealing with and are still going through this season? Uh, even as as they continue uh, to adjust during during this extended uh, COVID period. Um, well, um, I would say anxieties are such as um, human beings are also very social beings. So you want to be out with people. You, um, we Africans are very touchy feely. We want to be next to my friend, hugging my friend. Maybe down at the pub. Maybe down in church. You know maybe uh, going to play that uh, golf or whatever it is that you're going to do and you can't do that anymore. You feel so restrained because um, you're just in your house. Um, now, I'll tell you how I adapted earlier on. Um, maybe it's, it's, it, will, it will be helpful. Um, back in 2018, um, I was offered um, a very lucrative job and I'm an audiovisual producer. I was offered a job in, um, in Nigeria but this job meant that I was going to be working literally uh, about 18 hours a day, every single day of the week. Um, my child was going to come with me and uh, the nanny was going to be with me, but that meant that I was not going to spend time with a one-year-old. And the nanny would then uh, become the, uh, the caregiver and the love, love giver and everything. And I thought to myself, is that really what I want to be about? Um, it's, it's great, I'm going to make the money, but um, money versus love versus um, spending time with a one-year-old who doesn't have a mother at the time. And I thought, well, what I will do is I will um, go back, take steps back and start to build on a dream that her mother and I had, which was the bag company, and start to invest time and effort and, and, and try and really build it to a point where it can feed not just us, but the people around us. Um, that meant that I was going to have to work from home. Um, so my leather studio is uh, in, my, in, in my compound. Um, my office is in my house. Um, so literally when I opened the door behind me, um, you would hear Jay screaming and, and, and wanted to come in. Um, and I said, well, Jay, daddy's going to work. So she would understand that daddy's going to work. In fact, there are videos that I've done where people see her 
walk me to work, put my shoes on for me, my house shoes, um, albeit, and, and, and then say, okay, bye, have a nice day, I love you. And then she shuts the door and she goes about her business until about lunchtime when we spend lunch together and then in the evening. So what I did was I trained her in my mind, to, in her mind to know that this space is a workspace, this phone is for clients, and this is how we do things so that she adapts to that very early on and doesn't become an interruption during the day. But she also knows if she has an emergency, she walks straight into the office and say, daddy, this and this has happened. And she knows I will make time. Um, so literally there is a gate, but there's no gate, so, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I think that for, for a lot of parents, that's very frustrating. But the other thing that people have not had time to do, which I thank God I had time to do, was I had time to make my space into a work environment and a home environment as well. Now, one of the things I've done is I've made sure that I, the work environment is a serene space where I can think, um, I, can, I can breathe, I can look for solutions. Um, you have to find a space in your house that you can make into your sort of personal office that reflects who you are, but also doesn't make you feel like you're in a dungeon. It, it makes you feel productive, you know? Mm -hmm. So put plants, um, put things that inspire you in the office. Um, no, no, not just um, the normal office clutter, literally, but you know, you have, you have space to now put paintings that you like because um, you're not working with anybody apart from yourself. So <laughs> if the painting is going to irk somebody else, it's not going to irk you. You're going to love it, you know? Absolutely. Um, so put stuff, put stuff that really inspires you around your space, no matter how small it is, so that you feel functional and productive. Thank you for those. I, I like that. Uh, take my anxieties, be able to create structures and predictable processes that make it easier for me to cope. Even if it continues extending, I can adjust with whatever is going on. What about you, uh, Perpetua? I know you have extensive experience working with parents and children, and even children with special needs. What are some of the anxieties that parents uh, are going through, I mean, given this extended uh, period and the transition? One thing I, I, would, I would say is that one, for us as just parents, we, we just had the role of a teacher. But now when you come to a special needs parent, when COVID struck, they immediately turned into an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, a physiotherapist, an ABA therapist. So they immediately turned into that because no one could come to them and they could not go for the session. So first they were anxious about their children regressing. Will my child lose what the progress they had made in therapy this far? Will my child lose that progress? And then the other anxiety they had was, will I be able to do all of this at the same time? Can I be able to become a speech therapist and change into an occupational therapist and change into an ABA therapist? So those are some of the anxieties parents with children with special needs had. The other thing is that they were wondering, can I be able even to balance? Which time am I, am I taking? Am I taking, what, how do I even plan my day? Do I do therapy, occupational therapy for five minutes? Do I do speech therapy for 15 minutes? So the balancing between the, the being a parent and being all these therapists and just being you, because also they had also their own lives, they had their jobs. So those are some of the, the anxieties. Another anxiety they had was that, their children, the, the, some of the special needs children are susceptible to COVID. So they were anxious about, even if I, I agree, then a therapist comes, I'm exposing my child. So what, what will I do? Do I allow them? Do I stop therapy? Do I do it myself? And then even now currently, as you, as you even go forward, those are some of the concerns they have. If I, if I send my child back to school, is the school environment clean, safe? Are they safe from COVID? Because any chest infection, any child with any chest infections or any chest challenges, they're susceptible. So those are some of the challenges the parents are having or the anxieties they have with the current situation and even with some a bit touching on the future. Oh, thank you for that. I mean, very useful perspective, Perpetua. And, and during this, this conversation, as we go on, we will be addressing that and we'll be uh, speaking to how even as parents we can be able to 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 uh, work better or 
do a better job structuring our time and our resources in being able to, to support, I mean, to handle this transition. Uh, Kezia, over to you and, and hoping to uh, really tap into a child therapist experience here as well. Uh, we have looked at what parents are going through in terms of anxieties, but what about the children? It's been quite some time. Uh, some of us have told them you're going back to school. Again, you're not going back to school. Uh, I mean, it's, it's quite confusing. I think some of them even forgot uh, what school looks like. Now you're about to start telling them to go back to uniform and teachers and, and those, all those structures. What are some of the anxieties uh, that children are going through? And, and followed by that, I'll, I'll have Reverend Steve uh, just uh, speak to that as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Njeri. Uh, so in this season specifically, we have so many challenges and anxieties that kids do have. Uh, I know one that we joked about is uh, the fact that some of them are terrified to repeat a grade. Uh, just the, the thought of how to start over and it feels like all the efforts they had made in the current class were, are wasted. Uh, that for some of them is a cause of anxiety. The others who feel in this season with parents going back to work, uh, a new sense of separation anxiety, which they may not have had before because for the first time they've had prolonged time with parents. And so uh, right now, maybe the separation, almost like going back to the younger ages, like when you live for just a short time, uh, someone might be panicking and you're like, why are they doing this? And we've, they've always been able to go to school. Uh, so there could be a new level of separation anxiety or even the feeling of abandonment. Like when we go back to our usual schedules, now that you don't have the extra time to sing, to cook, to uh, do the various activities you are able to do, whether it's house chores together, then someone might feel like mom and dad are abandoning me again. Uh, so those are some realities that the children face. But on the flip side, there may be children who are anxious about staying at home, especially if there's a reason that home is not safe for them. So you find that in this season, uh, the worst and the best of us has come out. So we are quick to pick out the new skill we've learned, the new, but there are also toxic traits we might have found out about ourselves that maybe make the home environment not very conducive for the family members. And so there's a kid who's frightened. I have to stay longer in this same home that I feel unsafe. So it could be on the good side or on the negative side. Maybe it's not even anything to do with the parents. It could be a worker that uh, makes your kid uncomfortable or some practices that they picked up with neighbors or you know some addictions they picked up and now going back to life as normal is not the same anymore. So all these are anxieties that children are facing in this season. Reverend Steve, I know you have an extensive experience uh, with working with young people. Uh, your thoughts on that as well, in addition to what Kezia has just shared? I'm glad she's talked about the anxiety of repeating classes, and especially for candidates who are in class eight or form four, um, wondering how that is going to happen. And may I extend this also to university students, and especially those who have not been able to do online or who have not been able, because they're still our children, right? Uh, who have not been able to continue their education that way. Um, and I'm glad Kezi has also uh, talked about the, the home environment because that's important. And, and, and my prayer is that the, the parents who are listening in or who will also be watching this later are also conscious about other children that their children interact with. And I know there is such a question that popped up in regards to how do I guide, and uh, sorry, Njeri, for picking this up. I think it's important to mention it here. Uh, who asked, uh, what do we do with, with children who are teaching our, our children the wrong thing? And here's the thing. It's because you're seeing it right now because of your compound or because of your apartment place. But children also do go to school. And you don't have a keen eye to see what is going on there. And I, I keep insisting that the parent always has the opportunity and the blessing 
of being able to impart in their children what they need to be right because one day uh, they are gonna even leave um, your your watchful eye and go to secondary school and possibly boarding and eventually to university so don't be scared about what you're seeing even if it is bad uh, keep now getting uh, a more impetus to continue doing what is right with your children and teaching them what is right I, I suppose that some of the anxieties that, that uh, children could be having is the general safety of themselves and of their parents i know when corona started and all news was going when i'd come back home the children will ask me how i am how it was out there i think that is one of the anxieties that they have and it's important to also uh, uh, be aware of it uh, what changes will they find in their school i mean if our nation is important. If our, the Ministry of Education is 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 um, takes this importantly in terms of spacing out classes and building more, uh, what is going to happen? Are, are there teachers who are going to change because they have moved on to another job? Will their friends change schools? Okay, so so those 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 are some of the things that 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 could be going on. How do they adjust to the new health guidelines now? Because I interact with people, uh, Jerry will allow me to continue saying stuff like this. Have you seen those memes where a child goes to school with one mask and comes home with another? Or, a, or, a, or, you know, a parent takes their child to school with this mask, then they pick the child with that mask and come home and find they pick the wrong child. So you can imagine, how do we adjust to the, to the guidelines and, and all that kind of stuff? And what responsibility does a parent uh, help, help in doing that? But may I, allow me to tie the two because you, you asked me to speak last on this question. I think parents have a very important role to play in how children get to adjust. I think most of the anxiety for children comes from parents, not necessarily from what the children are hearing and not necessarily from what we are even saying here. Because if a parent is saying to Likula school fees, okay, that child, that might stick to the child because that has been one of the concerns, even though my concern has been my children have grown bigger. So I'll need to buy a new school uniform, okay? Uh, so where are we, are we going to get money? So if we are holding that conversation and it is being audible to the children, let us not think that they are not processing. They are actually processing and, and going like, wow, how come, uh, it, do we have the money? Do we have the space? Are we going to be able to go back to go back to school? So as parents, let's be also uh, quite observant about the conversations that we hold. Some of them are meant to be in the car. And once we're out of the car or on our walk, and once we are out of there, let's stop. Lastly, if you have teenagers, chances are they want to be away. <laughs> chances are they cannot wait for school to reopen, for stuff to happen. Now, they're at a stage where they enjoy the food they eat at home. In fact, uh, uh, it is said that teenagers close their mouths when they are asleep. All the time they are awake, it's eating time. And so parents might be wondering about that budget. You know, we'll be happy when the children go. Maybe even the parents are going to be happy about that. How do we prepare them uh, for, for, for going back? And that might be an anxiety with parents over have our teenagers gotten the right thing or is it that they can't wait to be away from us and go and enjoy and enjoy that, that freedom? So chances are some are tense and others are not tense. They cannot wait to, to go back. No, thank you. I mean, some some really real insights. And thank you, Reverend Steve, for sharing. It's true. I think a lot of parents, that, that meme has been doing the rounds to Likula school fees, you know. And it's true. I, I hadn't quite looked at it that way. What is this child thinking when you're saying that? Perhaps they're thinking, well, maybe I'm not ready uh, to go back to school. Yes, yeah, so, so quite some sobering insights in there. And what I'm picking is there's so much uh, from everything that's been going on, so many mixed feelings, emotions, joys, concerns, you know, are some things we're happy about, some things we are concerned about. But you know what? No matter everything that everything that's happened or is happening, there's a new normal. And there's a new future coming up. It's new because it's coming in with adjustments we had not foreseen or anticipated that we'd have, whether it is for parents or for children. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Perpetua, how can we encourage parents and children? Because we're going to be dealing with a lot of this and it's now our new normal. It's definitely our new normal. Schools are going to open sooner or later. In fact, if you count the months, at most within, within a month, two months, school is definitely opening. Whether it's not this side of the year, it's actually in a couple of months. 
definitely uh, going back to work. For those who are already not back to work fully, it's definitely going to happen because you cannot keep the strain uh, on these businesses uh, for an extended period without an impact. So we definitely are going to be making certain adjustments. Uh, of course, the concerns on the masks coming in as different. How can we encourage parents and children in dealing with the new adjustments? Of course, separation anxiety is, is right there for those who spent a lot of time in facing this new future. I would start by saying that uh, as parents, we should actually clap for ourselves because we, we have tried those many months of, uh, of staying indoors and staying with our kids and uh, juggling those balls and uh, some of them are cannon balls, you know. So as, let me start by saying it is, we have already, we've already done a good job. We have already come a big step. So the next step is just the, the adjusting and the, the adapting. So the first place I would like to say is that we start by expressing our mixed emotions. <laughs> either to our friends, to our families, to our spouses, not to our children as such, but we need to express them. We need to say to us, as, 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 as Reverend Steve said, we need to share with our spouses in the car, in the walk, and say, hey, I have this concern and I have this anxiety. I have this fear. I have this. And then when you come to the children, you look all macho. But anyway, we need, we need to share our, our anxieties. We need to share our frustrations with close friends. If you don't feel that way, we need to write it down, jot it down somewhere in a journal, but you need to bring out those emotions. Because as much as we don't bring them out, they don't go anywhere, they just pent up. That's why we find that we fire up when something small happens. It's because it's not because of that, it's because we have not been sharing what is inside. We have to just admit we are human and we share those emotions. So that's the first thing. The other thing we need to prepare our children to the going back, just have those discussion as, as, as Madam Jerry said, just have that discussion with the children. What do you think uh, is happening? What do you think you're going to face when you go back to school? What, do you, what will you miss at home? What will you miss when, when, when now you go to school? Is it the eating, if it's the teenagers, as Reverend Steve has said, will you be missing cuckoo as you're eating there in school? So ask them, ask them such questions. <laughs> so they start engaging and you are preparing their mind to start really going back to the school setup. For the really young ones, just, just talk with them and show them stories about change. They're called social stories. Tell them when the rain uh, shines or when the rain rains and the sun shines, what happens to the plant and to the bugs and all that. And now bring it closer to them because some things are far-fetched for the younger ones. And even for those with special needs, just start bringing the story from afar. Show them how change happens. And then also show them the advantages and disadvantages of not adapting to change. You can even make up stories about the hyena who didn't change and something happened. So as Africans, we are very good with storytelling. So let's use that advantage to just tell our children about the change. Create stories, look for stories. If your child is artistic, let them draw a change. Let them, so just tap into it. Let, just ask them, express to them, show them, tell them stories about the change. That means you'll be preparing them. So by the time schools are opening, as by the time we'll be going back to work, the children will be ready and us will also be ready. The more we have these discussions, the step closer we are getting into it. Talk about the masks with the children. Ask them, are they comfortable? What do you think they can do to make it comfortable? Because they, there's many schools who request them to wear masks. So ask them if they are comfortable. And then also, if the, the children are nonverbal, just use pictures and the, the, the visual boards. You can just do stories and things that are pictorial. So just see and learn your child and see how you can teach them and make them adjust to this change. But as adults, we, we also need to adjust in our minds because we also prepare ourselves from separating from our little ones. If you have your child always around you, start preparing yourself psychologically. There are moments they won't be around you. So that's what I can add. Oh, thank you for that, Perpetua. In fact, I was saying, so to your last point, I think it's the parents who may actually need therapy or more preparation. Uh, the children may adjust faster. You know, yes, uh, great points there. We need to share our concerns, whether we're going to write them down, talk about them as parents, what are we really concerned about? And even for the children, begin those conversations, you know, so we can begin to bring to the surface our concerns, because perhaps they're not even that major issues are out of control, but possibly some are. And talking about them could definitely help us be more prepared. Ted, uh, for you, you, as you told us previously, I mean, adjustments are things you've had to do before. Please share in your experience uh, with us how 
we can ourselves deal better with this new new adjustments and this new future. Um, I'd, I'd like us just to um, take a moment and think back to if this pandemic happened in 1989, would we be able to work from home? We wouldn't be able to work from home because we would be in a crisis mode. That we, we didn't have the technology to be able to work from home. We didn't have the, 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 the um, cleverness to be able to work from home and all these tech gadgets that we have right now. And um, it has happened at a time when, thank God, you know, you can use your smartphone and still be online and, 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 and work from home. That's really, really critical. So as, as you knock yourself really hard on the fact that you can't work from your office, remember that it could have been actually a lot worse and you could have been in a situation where you had to work using uh, the postal service and um, send, send out letters and stuff like that because that's the only technology we had in telegrams. You know, now we've got all these fast moving um, technologies such as what we are using right now to be able to have conferences, meetings and, and, and work. Literally, work is happening slower, but it is still working. Work is still happening and you can find work. Um, <clears throat> in terms of adapting and, and things that you need to do, I think if you, if you create pockets of time, so, you know, from eight in the morning till about 10 in the morning, you are busy doing your business meetings and conference calls and everything like that. And then from 1030 to 11 o'clock, you're having your tea with your young one and uh, checking on what they've done in terms of homework. And then maybe you go back into your office and get some of your own productivity done. And at lunchtime, you break early so that you can cook a meal for you and your family. And um, two o'clock, you have uh, maybe two or three hours back to work. In your, in your environment and then you shut down, that's important. What I've done actually is very, very different. Um, I run a 24 hour online shop. So my sleep time, I kid you not, is between four o'clock and about 8 p.m. That's when I take a nap. After that, I am spending time with Jay and also speaking to clients in my living room because sales happens 24 hours round the clock. And this is going to be the new norm for all businesses, whether they like it or not. Because also remember that this is happening at a time when online shopping habits have changed, trends have changed, people are not going to malls anymore. The malls were already complaining that they didn't have traffic. This has only gone to cement our shopping habits even harder. So anybody who's doing um, online businesses needs to know that they have to sort of, um, you can't work eight to five anymore. You literally have to create a different time patterns. And actually <laughs> we are at a, a digital revolution the same way um, the, the steel revolution came in and, and, and changed things. Um, so we have to realize that um, our habits may have been um, stopped intentionally for us to think and regroup and re-strategize. How do we move forward? I know even you as Britain right now, you've been um, re-strategizing. How, how do we work with our staff? How do we plan ourselves out? What are the work hours going to be? Um, what are the deliverables going to be? Because everything has changed for everyone. It's not a bad thing. It's time to actually take a deep breath, replan, regroup, re-strategize and figure out how do we actually make it work from home or from wherever we'll be working from? Because nobody knows how long it's going to last. Uh, that doesn't mean that life stops. It means that um, we just become a, a different kind of character. Children are easier at adapting to change than adults. And you have to put on your childlike hat and realize that change, change is good. Change is very good. Change is good. Change is very, very, I think that's a, an entire sermon, uh, Reverend Steve, you need to give us as adults. Change is good. But thank you for those uh, comments, Ted. And, and I want to thank our audience uh, who are with us until this point. Thank you so much for all your comments and contributions. I want to speak to a few. Uh, Nancy Olo is saying that actually for her, she, she, ha she has actually been telling the stories. She's been telling the stories, preparing uh, for change. So Nancy, uh, very well done there. She's also telling us, you know, stay close to your children, learn from them, 
Uh, and uh, tying on to what Ted just told us, yes, they, they adapt faster. So perhaps we could definitely learn uh, a lot more from them. Another comment from Irene Nyaga, who's telling us actually her child is back to school. Her child is in grade four and she's totally enjoying being in school. I mean, what a wonder, you know, uh, she's already back a couple of weeks, is in one, two weeks, and she's totally enjoying being back in school. In fact, her major concern is all the stock that possibly we could shut down again. So perhaps you're worried about the wrong things. Maybe they are more prepared than we realize. You know, maybe these children are definitely more adaptable. The ones who, who need to, to do the changing is ourselves. But you know, the beauty of, our, of this generation that is now growing up, there's that nice uh, word we like to sentence, sentence on our CV that we are highly adaptable to change. For them, it will be real. Uh, for our generation, it's probably been harder and been tested. Uh, during this period. But for these children, they will speak to a, a time when they are growing up when everything was changed and they're going to be growing up with a more useful, uh, realistic uh, lesson on, on what change can really look like. Uh, I want to come back uh, to you, uh, Perpetua. You spoke to a change and telling us, you know, we can speak to our children, uh, we can change as parents, you know, but how do we then, and, and what are the signs parents should look out for that indicate that their children are positively adapting or reacting negatively to the transition because it could be positive change, it could be negative change. I want to be able to pick it up. I want to be able to know, is it working? Are my stories working? And at what point should me, should I as a parent take action? And possibly what action uh, should I take? Okay, great. So we'll start with the positive. We'll start with the brighter side of life. So I would say the positive ones you'd see uh, with the children, they would be, they would be less anxious in terms of uh, meltdowns. You'll find they'll cry less, they will have less questions. Sometimes, you know, when children have a, a torrent of questions, it means there's something in their head that they're trying really to bring out. So you'll find they will have less of that. And then they will also be, be, be free. They'll just be free. They'll be playful. They'll be happy. So I'll just major, majorly touch on the younger ones and the ones with the special needs. So they'll be free. They'll be happy. They'll be just be loving their life and just enjoying themselves. They'll be eating and sleeping well. Those are some of the things that would say they're positively adapting. And even when, they're, when you're separating with them, when they're going to school, they will attach to you like the first two to three weeks. But then after that, they'll be okay. They'll be waving to you, bye, bye. Maybe you'll be the one waiting for them there, but they will have adjusted. So the other, on the other side, when we say they are having challenges adapting, now it's the directly opposite of that. We find that children are, are, are easily frustrated, easily irritable. The, the things that make them really weep and cry, there are moments you can't really identify, does this thing amount to this amount of crying? Sometimes they don't. So such like things we find that the, the, the amount of the crying and the amount of, uh, we call them at times meltdown, they're on the increase. You find they, they, it's just a lot. And then also you'll find that there are children who now have now challenging behavior. At times it's just defiance. You tell them to do this, they do the opposite. You tell them to do this other thing, they do a complete opposite thing. So you find that sometimes they don't know how to identify even the emotion they feel. They don't know to say, I am anxious, or I am fearful, or I am scared. So they look for any other way to bring it out. Then you may also find the resistance to go to school. They will just say, I'm not going to school. I don't want to go to school. I cannot wake up. I am tired. <laughs> you know, so they will find a way of just resisting things that they would normally do. And then there are those who now find it hard to sleep. They, they just constantly uh, waking up at night or just not going to sleep at the right time. So challenges with sleep, you find that's one of them. There are those who were finished toilet training, you find some go back, they start bedwetting again at night. So those are some of the things you'll be able to, to notice when the children are having challenges. So the actions you can take, if it's positive, just keep on engaging them, keeping on, keeping on, just telling them you're doing a good job. Affirm them, tell them nicely that you act, I've actually noticed that in week one, you are holding on to me so much, but now you are releasing me as uh, very fast. So just tell them and, and tell them you're happy about it. So when there's positive change, just tell them. Sometimes positive change uh, just passes us or positivity passes us because our eye is very keen to negativity. So when you see it positive, just tell them, good job, keep it up. 
But when you see it's negative, what you can do is just have discussions with them if they're at an age of discussion or give them uh, a, a, an opportunity to be able to express what they, 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 they are feeling. First, it can be through art. Just tell them, draw, draw what you constantly feel during the week. It doesn't even have to be at that moment. Sometimes we discuss these moments even when it is not that moment. Just, just say, draw what it feels like in the morning. Because if you notice the, the more irritability or the crying or not letting you go in school, you can't deal with that moment at that time. So just wait for them in the evening and ask them, what was it that you felt in the morning? If they can't share it, just tell them, can you draw what you felt inside? So sometimes they bring it out through art. Sometimes they're able to say it. And then also you, you can also talk to them, just get to hear them, get to hear them. What, what, what was it that you are feeling? So one is hearing them. Two is to be able to help them get it out. Get, let them get it out. Whatever it is they are feeling, let them get it out. Uh, and then the other thing is if it is extreme and you find that if it has gone four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, just consult a, a child a psychologist like Kezia, get to get help for them. Sometimes if it's beyond you, get help, do a lot of consulting. My child is doing one, two, three, four, five. How can I be able to help them? So the action is just get help. If it is going beyond the, the normal time frames, just seek professional help. They'll be able to help you out on that one. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I mean, some excellent insights, right? I don't know whether you're taking notes like I am. Uh, to my audience, my my note my notebook is is my notepad is already quite full with some really interesting uh, interesting uh, ideas right there that I'm definitely going to make sure I use uh, to transition into this future. Reverend Steve, um, my teenager, uh, I don't know how they are coping. Uh, my young man, my young lady in my house. How can I make easier for them? And, and on the same line that Papecha was speaking to. Thank you, Jerry. And I really appreciate what uh, Papecha has said because it makes sense. Imagine it's just a transference of the first to the second, honestly. Um, uh, I, I, I think that the first thing that we really need to work on as, as parents is to communicate. That's, that's the way you will know whether they are being, whether the children are being affected or they are not being affected. I, I, I think most of the times uh, we, we, we feel as parents as disempowered to talk to our young people or to our younger, uh, to the teenagers and so on. But I, I would suggest that one of the ways of, actually the real way of getting to know the positive and the negative is communication. And I really like that perpetual have pointed that out. But something else to add on to that, I am a believer in being proactive rather than being reactive. Now, I have worked a lot with teens, and of course, you work with teens and you end up working with the parents of teens. And I meet parents who will continually tell me what they are observing and what they want me as persistive to tell the teenager. And I'm thinking, you know, I'd save you money, I'd save you time, I'd save you effect or the effect that it will have on the teenager if you actually uh, took the time to talk to them and figure out what they, what they are doing. For example, ask your child, how is school? Now that you're back to school, how is it? How is it going for you? How are the studies? Now, they might respond immediately or they might not respond, but you have asked. At least you're going to get a response. Even if it's a roll of the eyes or a verbal one, you're going to get a response. How was your day? What work did you do? Ask them, ask them for their books. Get to have a look. Who are you meeting today? Where are you meeting them? For how long are you meeting them? What are you guys going to do? Ask. It will help you and it will help them to understand that the response they give actually carries a certain heavy responsibility. Now, of course, on the, on, on the negative side is when you... Your, your questions or even your lack of questions is met with silence and withdrawal, which Papetra has ably pointed out, that, that could be very, very negative. Uh, but in the sense of the responses that you are receiving, you are able to know as a parent what it is that you're dealing with. Now, we all know uh, as parents who are here that when you're a teen, it is the age at which you are most impressed by people. That's why we call it the the age of a lot of peer pressure. Now, peer pressure affects all of us, honestly. It affects all of us. Uh, at our age, if I'm building 
some of my peers will start building because that's peer pressure, okay? But teenagers are affected even more by, 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 by the peer pressure. But you as a parent and I as a parent, I need to be conscious enough to keep that, those communication channels open, including a place of inviting um, uh, my son or my daughter with his friends or her friends to come to the space where we live, because that gives you an opportunity to also get to observe what is it that they do when they're out there so that we don't make our homes and our compounds a place that they cannot come to. And we also make it a place where they cannot live. So they are always out there. No, bring them in so that that way they are able to, 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 uh, to be in and to be able to, uh, we are able to observe what it is that they are doing. Chris Rock, now I'm a pastor quoting Chris Rock. Um, so uh, forgiveness on the chat line. He says that at, you are the parent of the child up to when they are released to be an adult, they're able to pay their own bills, they're able to bring up their own family, they're able to do the things that they're able to do. But I think as parents, so many times we abscond so early, and he, he pointed that out in one of his rants. You know, we abscond earlier from our parental responsibility and try to pass it on uh, to a professional. And by the way, I am a professional myself, okay? Uh, to a professional, you deal with, the, with my child rather than me dealing with my child and I'm the one who's paying their bills. I'm the one who's paying their school fees. I'm the one who's giving them food. They, they live under my roof. How about as a parent, you are able to communicate and get to us that, and you'll be able to know some of these things. However, I must say that sometimes you need help that is external as Perpetua has said. May I add one more thing uh, to that particular question? I think I want to insist on this one. Whether we have Corona or not, teach personal responsibility to the teenagers, teach them. And it starts from an early age. I believe that, that the age of, uh, the age that uh, Perpetua and Kezia hung out around of children is an age of care. Um, uh, it's the age where you have your teenagers. It's mostly an age of coaching because they are able to do so many things for themselves. It's an age of coaching. You are releasing while you are holding. You're able to give them certain permissions and certain liberties while you're withholding some so that they can show responsibility over the liberty they have been given. And that time is going to reach in life where you're no longer their caregiver, you're no longer their coach. You're at a place where you're watching them and just correcting one thing or the other, uh, that is happening over the, their lives. But teach them personal responsibility. When they do good, applaud it. When they are not uh, doing good, correct it, but teach them that personal um, uh, responsibility. Very powerful insights there from Perpetua and Reverend Steve. Thank you very much for pouring into us. I, I, I mean, if you, if you haven't had a chance to look at the first uh, webinar in this series, there was a lot on, on the whole aspect of, of to what uh, Reverend Steve is speaking about. How, when they raise their walls, how can we be able to bring down these walls? So if you haven't, please make sure you, you do. And, and, and for, to our audience, as you continue watching, do you have a friend or a, per uh, a parent, uh, a sister, a brother who you think can benefit from this because we are doing this uh, together? Please invite them, share the link so that they can join us even as we continue to deal with how to transition into the new future. I want to take a few minutes uh, to go to a couple of people who are commenting uh, on, on YouTube. And uh, I can see Shali Kokonya, she's saying there's definitely more pressure um, for parental involvement in our children's lives now than before. And this is definitely the new normal because we're bringing work home and um, parents are also under, under pressure to blend family and work uh, in the same space. Uh, I also saw Frederick Ogola who's saying that, yeah, my daughter really missed school. Again, uh, similar to, to the other earlier comment we've seen that she's back already and enjoys so much. She no longer wakes up with the alarm and she's in grade four, you know? I mean, uh, such powerful testimonies from those who've already uh, gone back to school. But a special mention, uh, I think the one group that has done exceptionally well, we want to clap for two groups. We want to clap for all the parents. I mean, you've done an amazing job and, and perhaps we are very hard on ourselves sometimes. We, we really give you a special shout out for the exceptional job you do. It's not easy. It's not easy, yeah? but, but you've, you've, you've really done an even more amazing job during this season. But the other group is our teachers. 
our teachers. And I see one, uh, Magda Chebet, we, we want to celebrate you. Uh, she's a teacher and she's saying, as a teacher, we didn't really know how the children will adapt or behave, but we were shocked at how easy the children took it and how genuinely they enjoy uh, being in school. You know, I, 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 the more I listen to this, the more I think that we, our children are more uh, ready for this transition uh, than we are. Keep those comments coming. Keep putting down uh, the comments. I can see Alison Kabara telling us, focus on your children's strengths and, and definitely some strong insights and areas that, that we can share. And I had one aspect mentioned about us as parents having given so much uh, of our parenting duties uh, to parents. So I want to come back uh, to you, uh, Reverend Steve, uh, just touching on, on that entire issue of handing over the parent, parenting duties. As we move forward into this new season, how will this season impact the collaboration between parents and teachers when it comes to education planning and parenting? Because previously, yes, we sent them to school and let the, the teachers do the work. We sent them to Sunday school. I mean, after all, there are teachers there who make sure they do most of the work. They come to me already baked and ready for me to just celebrate I have an, a good child. But this season has turned the tables for us. So how will this season impact on that collaboration? Actually, that's a very good question. And may I also add that even uh, Sunday school or the, the lessons we teach our children on, on, uh, at church, they, that responsibility has been like we've been shooting the video and uploading it and uh, parents are, are able to continue with it without necessarily us being present. So yeah, it's a lot of work that has happened but in terms of collaboration, I think uh, parents need to open up that channel. Um, we, we say that uh, children are brought up by a village. I think we need to bring up that channel of, uh, of collaboration where it is that we continue uh, talking back and forth with the, with, the, with the parents that we are engaged with or, or with the teachers that we engage with, whether it is uh, school teachers or even church, uh, church teachers. I think a second thing that is going to be important of uh, collaboration between parents and teachers, sometimes we are called for parents' meetings in school and we are not interested in attending uh, because it interferes with the way we have planned our days. I am at work, you are at school, continue ch teaching my child. I have that responsibility. Uh, I think it's Ted uh, who was saying earlier that, you know, we, we have this space where we have learned that we release our children to go to school and to the teacher. So the time they have them, they have them. And the time they're supposed to return them to us, then we can pick up from there. I wish it was smoother than that, that we are able to collaborate, that even the schools open up for parents to be able to engage uh, much more in the learning of their children. But I also think that one of the collaborative things that needs to happen is also the reduction of suspicion uh, between the parents and the teachers where the teachers think, you know, maybe you, the, the, the teacher thinks maybe your parents are not teaching you the right thing. And, you know, we all go through certain life cycles. Um, maybe a parent is unwell or maybe there is a um, uh, God forbid. And so when is coming home, uh, the, the environment is not suitable for them to be able to do what they were doing in school. And the teacher does not want to understand that because they need performance. But also the parent suspects the teacher. What are you teaching my child? Are you doing your work up to par? And again, I'll say this. Those conversations become very important over where they are held. Because if I'm talking badly about a teacher uh, in the presence of my own son or of my own daughter, they carry that mindset. It starts shaping how it is that they view uh, that particular teacher. I don't think I'll ever forget uh, seeing my brother audibly challenge a teacher uh, we were younger, audibly challenge a teacher at home. And the response from my dad was, was so heavy in protecting the teacher that we could not believe it. We, we first thought that he would protect uh, my older brother, but he protected the, the teacher first because he still needed his son to finish school one day. And he knows that, that those are hands that they, they are in. So that, that, that place of being able to communicate, because I think that's the point that I'll make. The collaboration has to be with these open doors, this open communication, this feedback, reducing the suspicion between parents um, and, uh, and, uh, and teachers, and then being able to figure uh, how, how are our children doing. 
I'm hoping Perpetua is also going to respond to this one because I think when it comes to education planning and especially with children who are lagging behind because somehow I think there is also that bias towards children who are doing well. Uh, <laughs> when children are lagging behind, how is it that we help them and how is it that teachers and parents are able to learn together and grow together? Thank you for that. And definitely, Perpetua is, is going to say a couple of words to us. Perpetua, over to you, how, how this season will impact on that collaboration and even more for the special needs children, because previously, yes, as you'd said, uh, they would go for these clinics during the season, perhaps it's not been as, as smooth. So in, in your view, how do you see this season having, impacting on, having an impact on that? Yes, so for the, I'll start with the special needs that are close to my heart. So I would say with the special needs, already inclusion in our normal school is, is quite a tricky place. We, we haven't yet included them in everything that we do in a school setup. So you can imagine the virtual world excluded them even further. So you find that some parents had to really try and do their own teaching at home. So the first collaboration is just between the parents and the teachers to know with each other, where are we, where are you, for those children who couldn't access the, the virtual, yeah? So we, we need to first start with where is this child and where are we starting from and where are we continuing from? So the first collaboration is just discussions, candid discussions between the parents and the, and the teachers and they share where the child is and then also with, with the teachers, I, I, I feel where, when, when a teacher says, uh, I, I understand this child, I know where they are educationally, just give room now to the parents to now share where they feel the child is. Because the last time you maybe you had that interaction with that child was a while back. So just hear from the parent with, with, with just an open mind, just hear from them. They might not be they might not be trained as you, but they have some insights because now they have spent months with these children and have been able to learn some things. So yes, inclusion will be good. And then also as we collaborate further, I would, I would request that if we could just continue with the inclusion bit, how can the teachers now plan for these children when they go back to school? How do they include these children in the setup so that these children can learn as normally as the other children or they can learn as the other children have that opportunity to learn. So that is one area of collaboration, I would say. And then also for the parents, I would just to encourage you, as, as you have been hands-on, don't release when you reach to the teacher. You know, there's that temptation of a parent of, you worked so hard and you're like, wow, I, you are just happy the child is in school. So I would encourage you, don't just release, just keep on doing what you're doing, be intentional, keep on talking with the teacher, getting to know where is my child at today, what are they progressing and what can I work on at home? So just keep on doing, keep on doing i know you, you'll have a, a one week break or something but after the break just get back and start being hands-on but uh, one more thing i would like to mention to the parents is just remember social distancing because we are so happy to take our children to school you'll be so tempted to hug the teachers so you can put a sticky note here say social distancing <laughs> Because I can believe as parents, we are so excited. I, I am sure that opening day will be more exciting than the students. So yes, please remember social distancing. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Perpetua. I mean, yeah, I, we will still remember to social distance. You know, it's become such a norm. Sooner or later, we, we may easily go back to just uh, quickly hugging each other. Thank you for that, giving us some excellent perspectives all around with our youth, our young children, special needs, but I want to narrow down to a very special group of people who we often forget uh, when it comes to parenting. And we are privileged to have two great dads on our panel today. And I want to come down to dads and fathers and, and, and even where it is a single parent, like in, in Ted's case, or where it is, it is still a couple. Um, to you, Reverend Steve, what is the significance of being a father and all and all and all parent uh, in your child's life? Uh, because I know right now dad is still quickly probably dressing up, trying to go out and work. And uh, perhaps maybe in some cases, mom is, is, is still the one largely doing the parenting. But in your experience, and especially because uh, of, your, of your experience as a dad, but also your parenting, I mean, your pastoral experience, what in your view is the significance of, of dad in the child's life? All right. I think that's a very, very good question. Uh, and I'm glad you've used the word maybe because I'm sure that it's not in all homes that uh, the, 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 the father is absent or something of the sort. I, I, I believe that there are homes that present a different kind of, uh, of setting for that. 
allow me to borrow from some of my learnings and especially from my father. Um, the father plays the role of being a provider. And I think that is where the, the, the blessing and the conflict comes in because the, the, the parents, uh, the father there is supposed to provide um, the resources. What, what are people eating? Where are they living? Uh, how are they going to school? How is that being paid for? And, and all those kind of things. But I think we have focused on that one so much, uh, on that particular role that we have missed on the other roles. And uh, uh, to be honest, because, because uh, Ted, Ted is here, to be honest, Ted, I envy you uh, because not every father has the same opportunity to be able to work from home and to be able to have that closeness and easy access um, uh, to, to their children. But I would say that in the role of being able to provide, as significant as it is, are we able as fathers to balance with three other roles that are very significant that are going to help us in the life of our children? Okay, so there is that provision and nobody is going to let you off the hook on that one, okay? So it's just a matter of balance. Um, but there is the role of the priest. A father gives spiritual guidance. And I, I, I know I speak from the place where I'm a pastor, but it's necessary, of course, for me to, to say it. You, you need to give some form of uh, spiritual guidance that helps uh, your child to be able to figure uh, where their soul is headed and how, how their soul is being fed so that all the wickedness of the world is not getting to them. They have a place that is guiding them, uh, including taking them to church and you as a father being present to take them uh, to, the, to the church. Let me add one more. A protector, a father, uh, is significant as a protector. Now, there is, of course, the physical part of protecting. I, 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 I'm not going to let my children be harassed by anyone while I see um, or, or while I view it. But there is also the protection of their ambitions and, 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 and dreams and guiding them towards uh, uh, what is right. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm going to be in that place where as a father, I help my children to see that there are some things that they might do to gain money in their lives that are wicked, uh, ways of corruption. How do I protect them from that? How do I start shaping their minds and their spirits to do what is right? A provider, priest, protector, but my key one is presence. Presence. This for me is key. There is no one who can do this one for you. I mean, a pastor could do the priesthood for you in so many ways. Uh, an uncle could protect a child for you. You might even get an older brother who's able to provide for you so that you can provide for your family. But presence, there is no one who can do this for you. Uh, we have a saying, as he na I'll use babae because the question is to the fathers. <laughs> As a funzo and a babae will be taught by other men. So it teaches me to teach my own boys how I have two of them, how I'm preparing them for the world because my intention is to do what my father did, to prepare them to be amazing men and proper husbands, to be men who will be released to the world, not to cause uh, pain, uh, but to be proper men who are going to do what is right. Uh, if they ever, with the provisions of BBI, if they ever ascend into any of those seats to do what is even right, because as a father, I have taught them by being very, very present. So I'd say some of my learnings have been that. I need stuff that I have taught in the church, but I'll say that. I'll say provider, priest, uh, protector, and, and that place of, of presence. Provider, protector, priest, and definitely presence. Very powerful. Now there are my four Ps or on being a, a great dad. And you're right. Uh, it's, it's not an easy job because you're, you're balancing all of these roles and any of them uh, can easily drop off. Uh, but it is good to see that intentionality. But I want to push it a bit further, Reverend Steve, because I'm asking, what if I'm a single mother? Before I come back, uh, come to Ted, what if I'm a single mother? Fine. How do I create, I may be doing provider, I may be doing protector. Well, fine, we don't have the big muscles, but mom is also quite fierce when it comes yeah. to protection. Yeah. Uh, I may also be a priest, but presence, I, I need a father figure. How can I take care of that? Very good, very good comeback question. Um, 
And I think this is the place where mentors can play a very good role. Um, I have even been in spaces just to push that further where um, um, not only the father is absent, but in places where even the mother herself is absent and that child is handed over to grandparents or even a single uh, grandparent in, in that particular sense. I think that's a space where uh, our, our systems could provide a good mentor and, and, and maybe it's a place of talking to someone else who can be able to help you to figure out where do I get uh, a mentor. If, if it is a mother, I, I would say, especially when it comes to girls, you can play that role very well. And when it comes to boys, is there an uncle you trust who seems to be balancing these things well? Is there an, an older nephew to them, or an older cousin? Um, uh, and I know sometimes we lean towards church, which is good, uh, but it is good not to also disconnect with, uh, with family. Where can we draw that? Where can we draw that balance? I will tell you that that is one of the things that we try to emphasize uh, in what we are doing um, in, in our church structure so that even parents who drop their children and maybe their lives are not going well, how do we help uh, these particular children? It's a role that we play. It's not one that we are happy about playing uh, because we, we figure out there is a way we can collaborate. But uh, if you can get a good mentor in a good balanced uh, place, it could even be a teacher, a good teacher that you can trust your your child to. Just somebody from one of those three communal places, church, teach, uh, church, school, and maybe from the family, from the larger family. Thank you for that. Um, uh, and I want to come back to my man, mom. I, I think that's still a, a tongue twister for me. Um, <laughs> Ted, your mom and your dad. So for yeah. you, it's not just intentional fatherhood. It is intentional parenthood. And of course, you're bringing up a daughter which has additional demands. I mean, girls uh, uh, have a, probably a, a bit more, they need dad, they need, isn't, they have a different uh, setting. So to you, um, what is the significance in your experience so far on your presence uh, in your daughter's life and this very uh, great decision you've made of, of working in, of structuring your life in a way that you are around her? I'll tell you, um, one of, I, I, a lot has been said about uh, being the high priest of your home and being present and being available and, um, and being the provider. Um, dads are not known to be the love giver. And I have learned to be in touch with my emotion uh, because I have to give her that affection. I cannot outsource the giving of love to my daughter uh, by somebody else. I can't give a total stranger that uh, opportunity to give her that love because um, she has to know how it is to be loved by a parent. She has to know how it is to be loved by a father, by a man. And I'm the first port of call. So how I love her will be reflective of all the other relationships that she um, adop adopts in her life. So um I've, I've had to actually wrap my head around this and I had to do this um, very early, early days because, um, you know, raising a child from the age of three months old by yourself, having to wash, clean, take care of, um, and also give joy at the same time, you know, men assume that that is very, very easy to put a smile on a child's face. It is the toughest thing on earth to put a smile on a child's face without giving them a gift is a very tough thing. And mothers do it every single day, you know? Um, so I've had to learn how to give love and, and, and be more emotionally available, which is something that dads don't do a lot. We're not emotionally available, we are detached. Because I provided for you the gift you wanted, I am okay. Um, because I provided for you the food that you eat, I am okay. Because I provided for you the security that you need, I am okay forgetting that how we love our wives, how we love our children impacts on very many generations to come. It either will determine the divorce rate and separation rate um, up or down just because a man was emotionally available to love. And when I say a man also, you know, mom sometimes can can be so caught up in the rat race that they forget that the children also need them emotionally. You know, you see situations where um, 
the child runs to the nanny when there's a crisis, as opposed to the child running to the parent when there's a crisis. That is really um, an alarm bell that uh, you have to out and find. Don't be too hard on yourself because um, the other day, was it was uh, Father's Day the other day, and um, I went to tell my dad a happy Father's Day and everything, and he said, son, I have not always been a good dad to you. I've also been learning. I'm sorry. And that really hit me hard because I've always thought, you know, dad knows everything. So wow, he's this rock and pill and everything and everything he does is, is, is based on his knowledge. He, he told me, he, I am a journey of learning to be a parent. I'm 50 years old. When, <laughs> when your dad says something like that, you're, you're left wondering, wow. But it left me with a nugget, which is don't be too hard on yourself as a parent. Learn and understand that you are also learning. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. And it's true. I, I, I agree. A lot of us, to a lot of us, dad uh, should be Superman. Thank you. Very, very strong point to state. And I want to come back to you, uh, Reverend Steve. What advice can you share with fellow men about juggling fatherhood, career? Because I know, yes, well, you are a pastor, it is a career, and still having a life. I think we normally forget the last part, having a life. And please, as you answer this, feel free to give us your personal experiences or personal highlights as a father. I, I must say, Jerry, I'm really enjoying um, uh, listening, especially listening uh, to my fellow panelists and uh, loving what, what Ted uh, just shared, especially that bit of, 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 of love um, and how even my own children will interpret uh, that love extended to them. How, how do you have a fatherhood, career, and having a life? Um, allow me again to borrow, to borrow from my father. I, I was invited to a TV show once, and uh, I, I think the, the hosts of the TV show wanted me to really share about the pain of, uh, of fatherhood or even the absence of fatherhood and, and all that. And I must confess that I'm one of those people who's been blessed by having a present um, active father, not that we had everything. In fact, we did not have much, but uh, he was present to do the things that we are talking about, including loving on us and teaching us how, how it is that we, 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 we love. And uh, in my job, I think it's one of those that you can do and over commit yourself to everything that you do. I look at uh, people who are working for corporates uh, and uh, people who are working, maybe working and holding a business on their side and as such, their time is very demanding. And uh, it's almost every meeting that I go to, a function that I go to, that people mention that pastors are busy. And it is true. We are busy. We are called to almost everything. Uh, you're called because there's a crisis here, or there's a death here, or somebody has been taken to hospital, or there's a visitation that needs to happen, or a counseling, and you still need to be the parent to your, to, to your, to your children. I'd say this. Let me add to the four Ps that you had. Prioritizing. I think that's the respond to this question that you've asked. How, how do I juggle between fatherhood or even motherhood and career and having a life? Prioritizing. I keep telling my team that um, a call from school or from my home manager will make me leave what it is that I am doing and they can wait and everything can wait. Uh, I know this is going on YouTube, so it's going to be dangerous for me to say, um, including the fact that I was supposed to be doing something in church. It's going to wait. That's why I typed my summer notes, so that if I need it somewhere, somebody else and continue preaching. Because in reality, uh, and Jerry, you said that you have seen me do that. So you see me reading something. It's actually something, and, and uh, I have witnesses that it is all written out because my priority is them and, and the family there. Because even if I was to get fired, guess where I'd go? To them. So if I don't create a good balance of, of family and how I'm serving them and how I'm caring for them, um, and providing and being a priest to them and being present for them, 
then I'm going to have an issue. I, I, I prioritize how I do prayer time with them uh, uh, and, and with the children. I, right now, I've also become a teacher and an examiner. I think um, the Teacher Service Commission needs to come and visit me. You know, I'm not the best teacher, but the children love me, okay? Um, I, I, I should say uh, that in some senses, I have an adjustable job. I could choose what time I report because, you know, I could do this or the other. But I applaud parents who are doing so hard, who are working so hard to be present and to prioritize being with their children. But as I say, work and resources will not replace, replace presence. Uh, and, and again, I am biased because of uh, the presence of, 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 of my dad, who was very present, as I say. But how do I tie it with having a life? You see, I also choose who to have a life with and where to have that life. Where we hang out, where we do our parties, our trips, our events. If I don't, uh, if I don't make uh, that a priority, if I don't choose to do that, then no one else will do that for me. Uh, the urgent, this is how we say it, the urgent will always take the place of the important. The urgent will always take the place of the important. And so it becomes very necessary for me to figure out how do I prioritize what it is that I need to do. And that way I'm able to balance the things of life. Excellent insights, right? I mean, I was just listening, I was just taking them down. I took the fifth P, uh, fifth, uh, P uh, prioritizing. Yes, there's all these things going on. And of course, dad still, still needs to go and be all these things, provide a, a protector, priest and everything else. But at the end of the day, yes, prioritize. I don't think it's an issue of quantity, perhaps it will be really quality time, uh, even if I get to see them and have those and, and they feel that I'm present. I almost dare say, perhaps uh, even from what you're saying, put the mobile phone aside um, for that short duration. The few meetings can wait at that particular time so that you are intentionally present at that moment. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, back to you, Ted, my mom, dad. Um, speaking to intentionality on, on, on presence, uh, could you speak a bit more to juggling between fatherhood career and still I underline having a life because the one thing about COVID uh, it's there's time for everything else except your personal life so how you have been juggling this um I I I was very intentional about um having Jay um so I didn't have the challenges of um I need to have a life I need to go down to the pub and have a drink with the boys and all of that um so even before COVID came, I luckily and thankfully had already um, put in place measures to make sure that I am just living my life according to what I want to do at the time. Um, but like I said, in, in, in a day you have to prioritize in as much as you prioritize your house. So in your house, you've got your workspace, you've got your, your eating space, you've got your lounge space, you've got your television watching space, you've got your play area. Now, in, in, in your life also, um, as a parent, uh, not just as a dad, you also have to make a play space, um, you have to make a, a, a workspace, you have to make a, a family space, you have to make all these rooms um, in, in, in 24 hours, so that you enable yourself to regenerate, repurpose yourself, refocus yourself, regroup yourself. Um, you're not a train, you can't just keep on go, 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 go. At some point you have to stop, you have to take a break. Now what I do, for instance, um, when I am regenerating, refocusing, rethinking, is I walk into my recording studio, I'll play some music, I'll listen to some music, I will um, put on my keyboard and uh, music is a very easy way to detox of, you know, all the stress of the day. And um, Jay knows that daddy's in studio, he's playing his music and stuff like that. And she won't really inter interfere with me when I'm doing that. Um, uh, some people would like to go to take long walks in the woods, which is a good thing. I really recommend, especially if you're having issues with your blood pressure, hypertension and stuff like that, um, go for a walk in the woods. 
that fresh air and that walk is really helpful. Do not remain seated all the time because being seated all the time, we were not made, made to be like that. So we have to keep on moving. Um, go for a walk in the woods, go for a, a short drive, you know, um, and, and do things that help you regenerate and refocus yourself and repurpose yourself so that the next day you wake up um, fresh, reinvigorated, and also that you have something to give. I give this analogy all the time. You cannot give from an empty cup. Your cup has to have something for you to be able to share. So if you don't have time to actually go and um, you know, fill your cup with the things that you require, if it's some alone time for you to just reset yourself and think about things, if it's um, going to you know, watch, watch a movie or um, watching a movie at a home, make those play areas available and let your children know also that, you know, I'm human. The same way you want to watch your cartoons, I need to watch something and relax, you know, so that uh, you, have, you have this wheel in life that you can say, well, between this time and this time, I'm doing this. Between this time and this time, I'm doing this. And don't be too rigid about that wheel. I'm, it's life. Life is malleable and fluid. So you also have to just um, adapt to that uh, fluidity of life. Thank you for that, Ted. And I can see even some of the parents writing, I'm a young parent and, and I'm learning a lot. Thank you to each and every one of you. Peter, um, I hope, I mean, some of these lessons are helping some of us. I can tell you there's, there's no, even for older parents, there's still a lot that we are learning from our excellent uh, panel today. Thank you, dads, uh, for sharing. And once again, I want to celebrate the two of you and every other dad on this forum because that deliberateness, is, is, it pays off. It definitely uh, pays off. And often I know we speak about mom, but today we want to celebrate you uh, for that intentionality. I, I, I can see so many comments uh, from all over the country and even outside the country. I can see we have people watching us even from Oman. I can see uh, people watching us from all over the country, LD, uh, Kisumu. Uh, please make a note, let us know where you're you're, you're watching us from. So at least even as we share, uh, we can always uh, make a shout out here and there. I want to move on. And uh, please let me know if you're still there because I want to go into a quick 20, 25 uh, minutes session uh, where we'll be speaking about building resilience through transitions. And this is important because we want to equip you not just to deal with COVID, but life and change is continuous. In a couple of months, years to come, we'll be having an election. There's always one kind of disruption or the other uh, that uh, most of them are, are not foreseeable. So we'd like to be able to help you be more equipped and more prepared. And I want to invite uh, up next uh, Kezia, who had introduced earlier. Just a reminder, Kezia Mutua uh, is a child therapist and life skills trainer. She develops and executes youth programs. She's a mentor a PR research expert and a public speaker. And as a, once again, she'll be speaking to us about building uh, resilience uh, through transition. Over to you, Kezia. Thank you so much, Njeri. And it's indeed a joy to be in the panel with Ted Josiah, with Perpetua Mondi, and with Steve Tuo, because they've shared some really good insights. And I that we have covered what would say, I think you've seen this in our uh, caring for the 99, and then uh, talk about why it's important to care for the one, the one who often gets neglected. And so on focusing on transitions, on the one. Uh, we have covered largely what we will do, and it's a great thing that most of us, when it comes to transition, we do adapt fairly well, but what happens when we're not able to adapt as well as we would like to? So that's what I want to cover today. And thank you all for all the feedback you've been giving. At, at least it's building what we will do today. So when it comes to change, the next slide, uh, we'll see that change has both, and we've said that, I think we covered the positive emotions and the negative emotions. We've talked about change, creating a sense of courage. There are those of us who go into the, from the old to the new with excitement. We, we are determined, we want to do things afresh. We look at it as a fresh start. 
And so it's refreshing and we are embracing the change. But other times we also feel uncertain and that can bring about confusion. We can feel anxious or we may become disinterested because we are uncomfortable. Then there is also the fact that it can bring out our insecurities. It can bring out a sense of grief because we are losing the things that, uh, the familiar things that we know and stepping into the unknown. And again, it can bring out our vulnerability. So that means in a change, we need to balance between the negative and the positive emotions. And I think we've done a good job in explaining how we can do, all the panelists have touched on how we can embrace change in the current situation, but also more importantly, uh, in, a, in a general outlook. So in the next slide we will cover those people that do not positively adjust to change. Now, how do we deal with that? And as I said, sometimes change can be perceived as a loss, a loss of the familiar, a loss of the known, a loss of our comfort. And so when we are going through loss, what do we do? We grieve. So sometimes when we are adapting to change, some of us will go through change in the stages of grief. It's not a, a one stage progresses to the next kind of uh, development, but uh, more like any of the stages can pop in at any time. So we have denial, and this is the point where you're in disbelief, or maybe you're avoiding the change, or you're confused, or sometimes you can also be excited about it, but you're still not ready to make the leap, or you go into shock and are not able to deal immediately. That's the denial stage. And then there's the anger stage, and this is the part where you're frustrated, that things are not working as you expect them to work, or you get irritated. What uh, Papetra was talking about, uh, when you see some of the kids ill adjusting and they are angry or irritated or anxious, that's the anger stage. And in these two stages, how best to deal with uh, all the changes that come there is to communicate. This is the point you talk. You don't assume, you talk with one another, you talk with your children, you talk, you call yourself to a meeting, you talk with your spouse. Uh, I feel this way about these changes. I'm getting frustrated. This is a point where you address your feelings through talking through them. Uh, other ways that were shared by Perpetua, you can still communicate by uh, therapy, you can still communicate by uh, play. It's a time where you just learn what is good, the information, and you can get the information whether it's through art, whether it's through play from children, or from adults, you can actually just discuss the emotions. Then we go into the bargaining stage, and this is where people struggle to meaning, and they start to reach out to others, to tell each other stories. We talked about the power of telling your story. This is the point where people seek during a transition. So at this point, maybe, let me give examples. Uh, so maybe you've lost your job and uh, Come this change, it means you might have to change your children's school. It might mean you might uh, have to make do with some uh, lifestyle changes, some things you are used to doing, you're unable to do anymore. Maybe you could take a family trip, but now you're not able to do anymore. And uh, it's also hard for the children to adjust. Though truthfully, children adjust much easier than adults do, but it happens at times that it might be a struggle with the lifestyle changes. So at this point of bargaining is where you're really, uh, maybe you are asking God questions like, why did this have to happen to me? Okay, now that it has happened, can you do this in exchange for this? You're bargaining, you're asking God to give you another option or uh, even if it's people, uh, maybe you, it's a point where you're debating, do I take on a debt so that I can maintain my lifestyle? That's the bargaining period or stage.
stage that I'm talking about when it comes to adapting to change. Then we have depression. This is the point where you might realize, okay, after all the bargaining I have done, nothing is going to change. Uh, so you begin to feel saddened by, okay, this change must take place no matter what I do. So at this point, uh, the depression point, uh, what you really need is professional help, guidance and direction. It can be for you as a parent or it can be for the child as well. If you're on a depressive state, your thoughts have changed. Uh, your actions are also going to align with your thought pattern. So if you find you're increasingly becoming more and more de dejected towards a change, when you feel like, really, I don't want to go on and I'm at my end, then it's okay to seek help. And I think uh, Reverend Tuo touched on that when he said, uh, when, when you feel like you cannot handle it on your own, it's okay to seek professional help. So don't die alone. There is help. And where you're not also able to get maybe professional help, reach out uh, to other people who can guide you on the way forward. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily just a therapist. It could be even in a church setting where, uh, or a religious setting where you find a religious leader to help you or a mentor to guide you through or help you through that season to keep you accountable. But it is important that in that depression stage, you seek help. And lastly is the point you get to acceptance. And as I said, these stages may not follow the cyclical, um, the cycle. It might happen, you go from denial to acceptance. Uh, that's possible. It might happen, you go from denial to bargaining and then acceptance, or it might be denial, depression, then acceptance. It doesn't mean you have to go through all the stages, but it's important to know when a stage is happening, what do I need to do? So as I say, denial and anger, your part is to uh, communicate so that uh, you get the help that you need. At bargaining stage, make sure you have a lot of emotional support and a depression and acceptance stage, what you really need is guidance and direction. So uh, as you can see, different uh, ways to deal with each stage that you're at in regard to uh, change and transition. So I want to talk about the signs to look out for and uh, Perpetua covered signs very well when she talked about uh, withdrawal symptoms, acting out symptoms. But I want to talk about the ones that we often ignore. There are many. It's easy to tell when someone was happy and suddenly they are sad, or when someone has been active and suddenly they're inactive. Those are easy to tell. Or when someone has been generally too quiet or too loud, than normal, but there are some that uh, masquerade and then, and we assume that everything is okay. And then maybe later discover that it was upfront and people were not okay. So those are the ones I'm going to cover as signs today. The key here is to make sure that you don't assume that just because someone is joking, that it means they are happy. Ask, is it, does, does your generally happy nature mean that you're happy? Seek to understand. It's easy to look at uh, outward signs and believe we've gotten it right, and then be caught by surprise when someone takes a drastic action. So in jokes and smiles, sometimes when people have difficulty expressing their pain, they hide behind comedy. And we've seen this a lot. Whenever we hear about, for, inst for instance, comedians who took their lives, you're like, it, it doesn't add up. Why would this person who made us laugh, who was generally the life of the party, be the one who uh, opted for suicide? A lot of times it's because we hide, these are masks we hide behind. So the next time you see someone joking and smiling, just ask them, are you truly okay? Just seek to find out. Discuss the actual feeling. Then we have caring for others. There are some who 
they are okay. Uh, and in a transition, they make sure they take care of everyone else but themselves. Busy. Da, 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 da. Let's take care of this one. Let's take care of this one as a way to escape the emptiness they feel inside, the undeserving nature. They feel, I don't deserve to be loved, so maybe I can love others the way I would wish to be loved. So if you see a case of a giver, someone who is over giving in a time of transition, just stop and ask, what do they need? How can I give back to you? So as you see it happening all around you, that person who seems to be always ready in the office, for instance, with the changes, to help you out, set up your computer, that person who is getting everyone tea, that person who is going out of their way to make sure everyone else is okay. Also take time and ask, are you okay? And how can I support you? Then there are those others who decide, now in this transition, my way is to achieve. I don't know how to work around it. I don't know how to pause until I have done everything I can possi possibly do. So it looks like a positive thing because they are hacking the transition, but deep down inside, they feel like imposters because they don't know what they're doing, but they're just trying to make it work, trying to win no matter the cost. So if you see a high achiever, don't assume, like if your child goes back to school today and they're suddenly scoring in everything, that that means that they are doing well. So ask them, uh, how do you feel about your grades? It might look like it's a simple thing, but we often don't worry about the high achiever. The poor achiever, we will ask a million questions. Oh, Mwalimu, do we need tuition? Oh, Mwalimu, why is my child not doing well? But sometimes kids are high achievers or we become high achievers because we are trying to run away from what it is that we need to deal with. So ask your child the next time they do well or they overperform. Uh, and you, especially where you notice they don't want to make a mistake, then that's an indicator that maybe you need to watch out that they are high achieving is a form of perfectionism. So make sure you ask uh, whether they made any mistake. Sometimes it's okay to show them that it's fine to make a mistake so that they don't think mom and dad will only accept me when I, when I do well in school, when I do well at, at, in the home place. I'm also accepted and loved and I belong when I don't do well, when I make a mistake. So that's another sign to look out for the high achievers. And then the ones who seem unshakable, or oh, something drastic has happened and they seem to be strong, to be handling it well. Maybe they are numb to the reality or to the workings behind the scenes. Maybe they become too accustomed to pain that they no longer know how to feel pain. So if you see someone who seems unshakable, then you should ask them to take some time back to reflect. Is it truly that you're unshakable or have you become immune to empathizing with others? Or have you become immune to pain? And then the last one is those ones who are constantly busy. So they become busy to distract themselves from what is happening in their own lives. You have a full schedule as a parent. You're running away from maybe something you've seen in the house setting. Maybe that neighbor's kid who is negatively influencing your child and you don't want to deal with it, you put it in parking. Or maybe you've had a squabble with your spouse and you don't want to deal with it, so you hide behind your computer. If you're constantly busy, it is a sign that there is some Thing you need to deal with and you're escaping from. So if you're using your busyness as a form of escapism, then that's a sign to look out for that you're not adjusting well to a change. I hope so far I am clear. Okay, so these are the signs, as I said, they are not the obvious signs we usually look out for. They are the moment where people um, don't deal with things, don't get to hear from stuff because they are behind these walls, these fronts, these masks. So you could call this the five masks uh, that people hide behind.
So in the next slide, we're going to see uh, other ways that we cope not well or unhealthy ways to cope with change. So sometimes when we find that we are not getting what we want, we resort to addictions. And addictions take many forms. They can be, the ones we are used to are substance addictions, where you are addicted to alcohol or drugs, or even something as food, uh, where we comfort eat or do not eat to hide our problems. So if you know that usually uh, people notice when you dip in your energy, so you, you take something to keep you at power in energy. Maybe it can even be an energy drink. It doesn't have to be a hard drug, but you're constantly on energy drinks just so that you're, you, you keep going. That's substance abuse. Uh, some people resort to uh, working with people. Uh, you, you drown your pain by transferring it to people or to activities with people. So you might engage in sex more or join a gang just to feel the uh, sense of belonging or become dependent on someone. Like uh, it could be a mentor, it could be a child where you bring in a child into your marital issues or it could be a child depending more on a particular uncle or a particular auntie because they are feeling inadequate in a certain sense. So that this, this person becomes your drug. Uh, you, can, you feel in a certain sense you cannot live without that person. They become the reason for your existence. So that's another way people negatively adapt uh, by clinging to people. And then other times we might uh, resort to an addiction to an activity. Maybe you spend more, what people nowadays call retail therapy. You go on a spending spree, eh? buy new shoes. Suddenly you have 40 pairs and my goodness, in a day you can only wear one, at most two, uh, even with all the wardrobe changes. And suddenly someone has uh, a lot of appliances that they don't really need in the house when you find that your spending is not in check, it could be an indication that spending has become your addiction. It could be gambling. It started simply, oh, the odds. Uh, you know, we also have all these advertisements making gambling look, glorifying gambling. So you started with uh, 20 bob, uh, hoping to make, you know, the 20 bob you'd have bought maize with. And suddenly you're deep in debt because of your gambling habits or it could be exercise there are guys who hit the gym or swimming and are a sport and it becomes their new drug all the time selfies in the gym selfies uh, playing football selfies then that's a sign that you're negatively adjusted when an activity con completely consumes you it could be a hobby suddenly you're the golfer who is going everywhere uh, participating in all the golf tournaments, or it could be your work. You resort to working 24 seven, and we have covered some of them uh, in the previous slide. It could also be in your thoughts, which are silent, no one else knows about. But if the voice in your head is constantly uh, about a concern or other, your worry about uh, one thing after the next, then that could be a sign you're getting addicted to wrong, to negative thought patterns. Uh, when you constantly, now you have a voice that's obsessing over things or you're constantly in fantasy mode so that you're not really living in your real life. You're somewhere between the ideal and, uh, you know, if you find that your thoughts are cons constantly going to a certain place, it could be you've become you've become addicted to a certain thought pattern. And lastly, you can become addicted to a feeling. You can feel angry all the time over all the things, feel hate over everything. It started in one area and it begins to seep through to everything else. If you notice this, then these are signs, further signs that you really are negatively adjusting to a situation. As I said, if you're positively adjusting, well and good, and that's 
an awesome thing. That's 99%. But what about the one time when you're negatively adjusting? That's what we are covering today. So on the next slide, we will look at ways in which we can transition healthily. So in whether the transition, the transitions are many. It can be transition in the workplace. It can be transition in your marriages. Maybe, uh, unfortunately, you're going through a divorce. It can be transition to school or a new school uh, or a new grade or a new level or way of thinking can be transition in lifestyle. How can you be sure you're transitioning well? Now, the first thing to do whenever you're in a transition period, uh, I'll start with point number three. Please take time to eat well, get enough exercise and rest. Uh, you cannot deal with changes if you're already negatively, uh, you're negatively adjusted to it. So the basic, it seems so basic to eat well. Like that's the time your diet should be at its best. That's the time your exercise and rest should be on point so that you allow your body to be able to uh, deal with the transition. So that's point number one. Point number two, normalize not knowing. None of us has all the answers. Indeed, even as a therapist, I don't have all the answers. There are many times I go back to the drawing board and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Sometimes you might even feel like an imposter. Maybe you've got taken on a new job and in this new job, uh, you've been given tasks that you don't know how to handle. Here is the time where you tell yourself, it's okay not to know. Uh, then I can learn from someone. So uh, it, during a transition is a time to go back to set new boundaries, both at home and at work to accommodate the transition. So if it's a transition like this current transition, where we are going back to work, uh, you need to sit down again with your children and set new boundaries, not the corona pandemic boundaries, new boundaries that help you adjust at home and even at your workplace. Maybe at work you need to start addressing. Before I was available on call 24 seven. Now I'll only be available during the weekdays. Allow me to have the weekends solely for my family. That's a boundary at work. Maybe at home, a boundary might look like when we step into this house in the evening, after you've done your homework as children, we need an hour or two to have uh, our dinner together or to uh, have an activity together, whether it's a Bible reading or uh, we'll do a house or together whatever it is, but you're setting a boundary to ensure that daily you spend time together or daily you're doing something that is keeping you together as a family unit. That's what I'm talking about by setting new boundaries, both at home and at work to accommodate the transition. Then you can be intentional about reflecting on your thoughts and feelings. So as parents, we usually discuss with our spouses, um, what to do or what not to do. But sometimes we forget to rope in our children so that they learn how to uh, reflect on what is going on themselves. So be intentional about doing it for yourself so that uh, you don't carry home uh, work baggage, you don't carry home uh, baggage from fights you had with your spouse, uh, but time with children is time with children and it's uh, conducive and it's healthy. Uh, so be intentional about your own feelings. Sometimes it's good to say, uh, right now, as much as I would like to be part of this setup as a parent, uh, and Jerry, you talked about it. I need time out. I need time for me as a parent to go out, make my hair, uh, just have an hour of uh, baba therapy or saloon therapy <laughs> and not be apologetic about it. So those are some of the things we can do as parents. Uh, but what can we do then to help our children in transition as parents? Now, the next slide tells us how to do that, how to help our children cope with transition. 
So first of all, we cannot, we've mentioned this over and over, every panelist has talked about it, spending quality time with each other. Have time with your spouse, time as a father with your son, as a father with your daughter, as a mother with your son, as a mother with your daughter, as one family unit, spending quality time. And quality time is not time where, as a parent, you've gone to a restaurant, uh, then the kids go to the, uh, what are they called, bouncing castle, and you guys are away, and then you say, we had family lunch. That's a good thing if it's family time for you and your spouse. So uh, the kids being distracted is a good thing. But if you're calling it family time, it must be an active uh, activity or session together. So you would rather do a house chore together or, or adopt a hobby together, like decide we're going to be gardening together or we are going to have a sport together. It can be both random uh, you know, spontaneous, or it can be routine, planned, scheduled uh, as part of your activities so that you ensure uh, you, can, you, you have close time to observe. Whereas before you had all the time during this pandemic to observe what's going on with your children, activities are the best time to know if truly uh, a child is adapting well to a situation because we drop our guard when we are doing something. You tend to drop your guard when you're active, actively engaging your brain in something else. Then again, talk about your children, talk about your feelings with your children so that they learn to bring their worries and fears to you as a parent. So in those evening sessions, maybe the first question before you pray together or before you have your meal together might be, how was your day? What did you do today? What did you like? What did you not like? Uh, what are what is something you'd like to do better tomorrow? There could be different types of questions. Uh, try and keep it fresh every day. It doesn't have to be the same questions every day. Uh, today you could ask, how was your day? Tomorrow you ask, uh -huh, so what happened uh, uh, today that you liked in school? What did you like about school today? Uh, what did you not like about school? So that they don't learn to anticipate and give you the same answers, but each time they are talking about their feelings and their thoughts and worries with people that they trust. Then guide children to find solution to their problems, give them time to try and solve. So they've come to you, mom, I'm being bullied. We've gone back to school and been bullied or dad, uh, this and this happened to school. Hear them out first. What do they think uh, they can do to solve that particular issue before you come with your uh, with your solution. Hear out what they would do in their capacity or what they think they are able to do. Help them process through it. Okay, so what can we do? Uh, how do we go about it? And what action can you take tomorrow? What action can you take right now? So help guide your children by asking the right questions instead of just offering solutions to whatever transition they are finding hard to adapt to. And last, when they don't do well or where they experience failure or disappointment in this period of transition, praise the effort. Don't forget that even the act that they took to do something made a difference, even if in this case, it didn't produce the outcome that you desired. So praise the effort when they experience failure or disappointment to give them the courage to face that situation again, to face that transition again. And hopefully they will come to adapt and to appreciate the change that's taking place. So I hope each of us is learning something about what to do. And most of these things were talked about by Ted, by Paps, by uh, Reverend Steve. We have talked about them. They are not new. But just in case someone is negatively adjusting, I hope you have found something that you can take home with you. So on the last slide, on the next slide, we'll talk about the final perspective to have on transition. And uh, allow me, I'm Christian, and I hope all of us yeah, uh, Christian or not, uh, it's a godly perspective. Uh, 
to just internalize these verses that have really helped me through transitions. The first one is Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. Why should we not be scared or not be discouraged in transition? Is because the Lord himself goes before me. There is nothing that catches him by surprise. He knows everything. So if I go to him in prayer, he is able to give me the wisdom to deal with the transition. And he further reassures me that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Now it's in encouraging to know that I have an ever present help in times of trouble. And that gives me the courage to face whatever it is that's ahead of me. It's easy to say, do not fear, do not be discouraged. But not when, when you're not with me in that case, I might easily forget. But when you encourage me that I am here with you, I am, and that's the same thing parents can do, encourage your children. I may not be able to stop the transition, but I am here with you. Take him, going before you, I will be here when you need me. When anything happens, just call out, yell out, uh, come to me, say, mom, I need this, dad, I need this, and I will be ready, and when God enables me, I will help. And the last one is Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, that, uh, Present your request to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. What that means is when we present our request to God, sometimes it's knowing there are things that are beyond me. I may not be able to solve them. But if I have left them to the one who can, then he will enable me uh, to go through it peacefully. I pray that the peace of God in all these transitions might be everyone's portion here. And so I thank you all. And thank you very much. We've come to the end. Uh, any questions, any comments, feel free. Uh, let me know on the chat. Very, I mean, a lot of amazing insights. And, and I can tell you uh, from what you're asking, any questions, any comments, so many comments coming through saying, great presentation, Kezia, great presentation. And I want to, to, to tell all, all our audience, because I can see a number of you asking, can I get the presentation? This uh, webinar is actually live on our YouTube channel and will remain on Britam Group, uh, I mean, for the entire period. So you can always go back, play back, listen to it. I mean, all the lessons we're listening in today may not stick immediately and a lot of wealth of information here. So thank you, thank you so much, Kezia, for that. And, and yes, I have that encouragement. Do not be afraid. Uh, he's not going to forsake us. It's COVID today, it's something else tomorrow. It's definitely going to be, uh, we'll definitely uh, weather whatever storm comes. And thank you for preparing us to build resilience and to even identify when our children are masking uh, where concerns uh, are. So I want to go on to a few, um, audience questions, and, and I want to put them to my panel. Uh, and anybody who has a question specifically to Kezia's uh, uh, presentation, please feel free uh, to type it out. We are running a bit off on time, so I just want to ask a few, put a few questions to our panel that are coming through from, your, from you. Um, and, and I can see Emma is asking, how do I get on the YouTube uh, channel? Just check for on YouTube, Britam Group. Uh, Britam Group, and in fact, what I'd suggest is subscribe to the channel and, and turn on the notifications so that every time we post a video, you can be able to see uh, the content and you can also see the previous webinar that we had posted. So I will, allow me to move uh, to my questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions that you have shared with us. I have a couple for you, uh, Reverend Steve. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll put them to you, uh, two of them, and then after that we can move on. My first question from my audience is, how do you address death to kids below teenage in this COVID times? Because of course, uh, COVID, the reality of COVID is we have lost some children, not just uh, parents. And also another question coming in on, and it's actually from a dad, is asking, how can I create time for my family when my job is very demanding, Monday to Sunday, Monday to Sunday? So um, I'll be coming back to you, Steve. And then uh, Ted, you will also assist us in responding to a question from our audience. How can fathers be mentored to be great fathers? Is it actually possible to be mentored uh, to be a great father? I think it will, be, it will be good. So if we can hear a response to those two questions and then we'll come up to our final question. 
All right, thank you, Jerry. Uh, to your question of how do we address um, uh, death to, to children, may, may, may I expand the question a bit because it's not just COVID, it's also post, so we need to talk a bit more about that. I think one of the things we don't get to tell children is that death is part of life. I think we talk about life, we talk about events of life, school, um, uh, work, we talk about marriage. I think we need to introduce children uh, softly in starting to understand that death is part of life. It's it's difficult to do that. If you are able, um, I think when or they are of a certain, say maybe seven and over, and they can be able to accompany you to a funeral, you can be able to explain what it is that is going on. That way it helps them start preparing uh, 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 a wider view of life in that sense. But if it has happened in their family, I think it's important to talk about the circumstances um, that that have brought that and the finality of death. I think we go and we focus a lot on adults in some of those meetings that we go for and we, we ignore the child. We tap the child and we ignore them. I think it's important to let them know uh, in wise ways and in wise words, maybe softer and repeated, but as calm as possible, uh, that there is a finality to what has happened. Um, and also help children how to grieve. Um, I've been in situations, multiple situations, where people actually keep the children away from knowing what is going on. Let them finish class eight. Let them finish form four because they're about to do exams. So let us not tell them. Let us shield them. But then if they don't get to know through the right person or the right channel, it may be difficult for them to ever process uh, that particular grief. Let them know that there is a finality to, to it and help them even to cry uh, uh, through it. But also, I think it's important to, to, to build hope. Uh, to build the sense that, hey, we are going to suggest uh, to support you through the adjustment of this death. I think it is important for them to know, even though there is finality, um, who is going to do what the deceased was doing? Like if it is a parent, who, who is going to be doing that? Who's going to be providing? Who's, who's going to be cooking for us? What, what is going to be happening in terms of, of presence? Or even talking about the hope, uh, the hope of the, of the living. But I think there is something extra that is critiquing the memories of the person who has passed on alive. I, 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 think, I think don't shut the door on the fact that this person was there. They were alive. They have passed on. Um, help the children to keep that, that, that memory alive. And it could be something that they hold on to. Maybe it could be photos or, uh, or video carried from, from that time. But if adjustment and, and, uh, and hope, because adjustment uh, helps people to advance. So if the adjustment um, is not well done, the advance, advancement might have, might have an issue in how, in how children are moving forward. But please handle them. If as a parent, you ever find yourself in that situation, even while mm -hmm. visiting somebody else, please find a way of helping people address it to the children. Because I think we ignore them and I don't think that is appropriate. I don't think that is, that is good. Okay, I'll thank you. And, mm -hmm. do you. Do you want me to pause first? Uh, yes, if you can hold on just a bit. I want to invite Ted uh, to just uh, also okay. make a contribution to this question. I think if you allow me to go here, um, you also had, had to go, it may not have been a COVID loss, but you had you lost your spouse. Uh, could you speak a bit more about how you helped your daughter um, deal with it and be able to grow, uh, touching on what Reverend Steve was talking about and, and sharing a bit more on that experience? Uh, Ted? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. What, what I've done is, um, since Jay was three months old when her mom passed away, um, obviously she didn't know um, that her mom had gone. She just felt the emptiness sure that all the photographs and um, all the videos and everything are at Jay's disposal. Sometimes in the middle of the night, um, Jay will wake up and tell me she wants to watch a video of mommy and I will play it for her. Her mom used to sing a lot, so she would see all those things and say, oh, wow. And then um, now it has just become part of her life to a point where she's three years old now and she will, um, when a visitor comes, the first thing she'll do is she'll show her mom's photographs and say, this is mom, you know? Um, so she knows that she does have a mother. 
she is not here about her um, because I keep on telling her that. And she doesn't really ask for her mom. She just knows that, well, that's my mom lives in the photographs. When she grows older, I will explain. And I've kept um, things that her mom owned and treasured for her so that when she's um, older, she can actually have hold of it. But I've also gone a step further. I tell people that uh, the company that I've set up is not, it's not for me, I'm just a bridge. It was a dream that a lady had and she had wanted for her child to have. So I am just trying to bridge the gap until Jay is old enough. This was created for you. In fact, some of the bags are named after Jay herself um, so that she, she really lives in the legacy of the queen that was. Um, a lot of people normally um, would shy away from this and say it is very important to just forget the person and move on. And I say this to human beings, um, we are not like milk on a supermarket shelf. You cannot just go eat rotten milk and buy a new packet. Um, people come into the world for reasons, for purpose, for legacy, and we need to make sure that we really keep their legacies alive as much as possible because they were not a flash in the pan. Uh, the person who was by your side had a dream, had had things they wanted to do. And it would be very, very good if we could keep those dreams alive for them. Oh, thank you. I mean, uh, and then I can even see Emma saying that it's true. Her five-year-old has been talking a lot about her grandma who died two months ago. I think that aspect of, yes, acknowledge it um, and be able to help them celebrate this this person. And yes, I, I think for us, we normally want to put them away very quickly because we because it, it brings up some pain. But maybe for the children, it does help them to celebrate or bring out the whole aspect of continuing to celebrate this person. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Ted, and also Reverend Steve. I want to come back to you, um, Reverend Steve, before I come back to you, Ted, on the, on the question on, on mentoring fathers. How can I create time for my family, as was asked uh, by this dad who really genuinely wants to spend time with his family and his children, but uh, is, is torn? Reverend Steve? Uh, I, um, all right, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Hmm. All right. I, 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 I don't have a perfect answer for that situation. I really don't. Um, I think my answer was, was towards leave and, um, and uh, the leave part is how do you take your leaves, uh, the normal leaves that you'll get from work? Um, how, how, how do you do that so that you're able to prioritize that whenever it is that I get a break, I would, I would assume that there is, even if it's from Monday to Sunday, there is a way that you get a break or there is a creative way that you can get a break. I'm also hoping, uh, possibly even if what is open to send you a different place uh, in the country, like let's say you have to work in Machakos or Kisumu for a week or so, are you able to go with your, with your children, like when they have closed, so that you're able to spend more time rather than being rather than being, being away in that particular sense. But the second kind of leave that I want to talk about is leaving the job. I, I, I think uh, as a pastor, I need to say, uh, uh, pray, pray about it and ask God, is there another job that I can pick up? Is there another way that you can creatively give me to start something that helps me to be able to spend time, uh, to spend time with my children? Uh, trust me, when all is said and done, um, uh, the children are always going to be to be there if there was a thing to happen it would fire you and they would send you back home and if you've not created that community and that bond it's going to be difficult for uh, for 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 you, for you to do that I, again as i said i don't have the perfect answer but i would suggest a creative way of creating gaps or spaces that come to you according to to human resources and and, and maybe starting to pray about a different job or a, or maybe even starting your own business Thank you for that. And, and I can also even uh, speaking to this dad or any parent say, and as Ted had mentioned, today we have technology. So it begins to, even though at times it's not physical contact, we can even put them on a call like we have today. Every evening sort of ask them, how was your day and talk to them. 
So they still feel your presence. And then when you're physically there, then that can be uh, the quality time that you be, that, that we definitely use. Thank you for that. And Ted, I want to come back to you on the question, how are you always a deliberate father? Or, or, or that question of, can, how can fathers be mentored to be great fathers? Uh, Ted? Okay, I'll come back to you in a moment. I can come back to you, Reverend I'm, Steve. I'm here now, so. Oh, you're back. Okay, I, I, I so, could not hear um, you. I, I wasn't always a deliberate dad, no. Um, I have had to actually uh, intentionally learn how to do this. Um, but on the question of mentoring and spending time, um, one, I think it is time that uh, corporate um, Africa, especially um, the corporates in Africa started doing workshops where we can um, mentor real people and sit down with real people and um, host um, sessions such as this, you know, uh, uh, post COVID. So that we can enable them because we are moving from a transition of our fathers and grandfathers uh, were the colonial era. Um, here we are in the digital era and uh, we are learning to adapt into a different environment. Who they were and who we are is so different in terms of the requirements that we have and life has on us that um, we have to share the knowledge we have. We have to share the resources we have with uh, younger men and also sometimes older men so that we can understand that there are certain things that we can do just to alter like what pastor has said just to alter um you know something like um how about you speak to your boss and say hey look i've got a young family i do not feel i'm spending enough time with my family can you please allow me to come in to work at x time or to leave work at x time but i will still do my deliverables or can i spend one or two days working from home so that i can spend time with my family Remember, um, there's no rule book to this. There's, we cannot uh, live with the old uh, rules that were set out in this new age. Things have changed. We have to be cognizant of the fact that things will never go back to how they were. And right now, we have to make sure that mothers and fathers and children, the family unit, the core of family is preserved and made stronger. We are coming from a generation where divorce rate has gone up, separation has gone up, partly because we're spending so much time at work and not time with the family, partly because we're so career oriented and not love oriented. I am all about actually recentering and we cannot look to the West for this solution because I feel that a lot of the solutions being given to us are lost solutions. We have to look inside ourselves, you know, as African Africans and say, let us create solutions such as M-Pesa, which now the West is following, you know, that work for us, that enable us in this generation, in this society to be better families. And, 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 and thank you for that, Ted. And I, I see a follow-up question from a mom asking, can a dad actually be taught how to have a great relationship with their child, whether it's a teenage son or daughter? Can they be taught? Um, can a child be taught to walk? Yes, we, we learn through um, uh, watching other people. We learn through adapting. Um, and, and, and this is really, really critical. I say this, we learn to love by watching our parents love each other. That becomes our primal um, way of loving. And that becomes our literally our factory preset. So can a man be taught to love? If a man watches other men loving their children, he will desire to do that, you know, which is really important. So it's not just for corporate um, 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 Africa to start changing the narrative. It's also for the media to start changing the narrative, to show more of men engaging with their children so that other men can watch this and say, well, I want to be that kind of dad. I want to be that kind of mom, you know, uh, because there's been a lot of, to be honest with you, male bashing 
and, and, and a boy child just being put down without us thinking that we may be destroying the seed of the future. And actually, those boys that we are putting down now are the men that we will want to be fathers at some point. We need to uplift not just the men, but the women to be better parents. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, uh, Ted. And I want to come to my final question because before we, we begin to wind up. And uh, Reverend Steve, I want to put this question to you. And Ted had already begun to mention how he began Joker Jock, mostly for his daughter. Uh, Reverend Steve, many at times, and this is from one of the, the, the one of our viewers who posted this uh, to us earlier, many at times after passing out, some rich people and able parents are buried. Some of their well-gotten wealth is messed up by their children who are left behind with a lot of fights until the home becomes very poor, not to be recognized as, ever, as an ever able home. As a parent, what is the best wealth I can leave for my children to transit into the future with confidence and avoid such predicaments after I've gone to be with the ancestors? Okay. Um, I, I think that's a good question. It's a deep question. I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking it's a seminar by itself. Uh, but what, what I'd suggest is um, as we are bringing up children because some, some of us could be wealthy right now others could be rich uh, and when i use rich i mean building up towards their wealth i think there is an invested an investment of money and there's also an investment into the children then one of my biggest desires will be to see how it is that we invest in the children are they learning how to work are they learning the value of money are they learning where what they get is coming from what is it that the parents do and that this is being built for them are we teaching them deeply? are we teaching them? and are with them teach and, and and you're right jerry uh, we have seen some of these things also being displayed on media uh, uh being displayed on media i think as uh, as some of these guys also become very very rough with even people who have worked for their parents for a very long time. And it is possible it's part of the growth of a relationship where they were given so much and never taught to honor people, to honor people who never grew up in the same environment. So I think it's, it, it takes a lot of investment back so that we're not just handing money to the children, we are handing something that is wealthier. How, how are you disciplined? How do you handle money? How do you interact with people? Um, I think it's also a good place for parents to teach their children that this is what I do, and even to take them to work so that they get to see how a parent interacts interacts with people. There used to be businesses uh, before we started all these business, uh, fancy names like Jehovah Jireh uh, diapers or you know something of the sort. I, I think there used to be those places where somebody will start a business and it will be Jerry Jomo and Sons. That way the children know this is our heritage. It's not just something passing. It's actually a heritage. And, and if we are able to teach them that from the young age, I think we can able to resolve some of this. Um, um, yeah, that's my take. Thank you for that. And, and, and I agree, take them to work, show them that there is an effort behind the money, not just the money. And uh, we applaud Ted for beginning to do that. I'm sure as you're, as Jay comes to, she, she sees you every day doing what you do. I mean, then she really, even when she eventually does get the business, will really know what, where the sweat is. For us at Britam, and, and just to add on that, why we are passionate about education and children's education is because it all begins in what, how we teach them and what we teach them, making sure that they get the right level of education. Because if they get the right level of education, they, get, they have a level playing field out there. But if our children don't get the right level of education, when they step out, they are competing with other children who've had a better access to education. And already they're already starting on a, or not a very strong level. So which is why we are passionate about education planning. And I want to mention, even today, uh, over 60% of our customers are education uh, planning customers, customers of an education policy of one sort or the other. So. The foundation is in give them a great education, give them a right education, 
take them to show them the, 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 what do you call it, the foundation of how we get to this business, how is money made? You know, don't shelter them too much. Let them see the hardships. Let them see the difficulty. And in the process, when they finally do take on this business, uh, they will obviously have a better understanding of, of everything. I want uh, to bring this to a close and sadly so, because I, I think uh, there's so much wealth in this conversation. And I want to appreciate each and every one of you who's made time to be here. And I want to end it by beginning to request each of my panelists to give us a parting shot. And I'll start off uh, with you. I can see Reverend Steve, so I want to start with you. Uh, please give us your parting shot for today. Um, as the poster said, we have a lot to do for the foundation of the children. Uh, let's build their roots because they are going to fly. They're going to do much more than we did. They're going to see more places than we do. They're going to experience much more than we experience. Uh, let's invest in them to build their roots so that even when they fly, they'll be able to know how to, to return home and how to serve people well. Thank you everyone for tuning in and for being part of this. And thank you so much, Reverend Steve, for, for making the time to impart this knowledge on us, not just as a reverend, but also as a parent. I want to move on to you for parting shots of Perpetua. My parting shot, first one, a big thank you to a big company like Britam taking the time to invest in parents, working with parents, teaching parents, good job. It has been a great pleasure to work with all the panelists here with me. Uh, very happy to hear so many things I've learned a lot. To the parents present, to those who are not yet parents, because I'll see comment people saying some are not yet parents. Good job, thank you for taking the time to learn. And then to everyone else, have a lovely afternoon. And thank you so much, Perpetua. I mean, it's been such a great learning experience. There's, a, there's an interesting perspective you've given all of us. And, and, I, and I want to congratulate and appreciate you for the great work you're doing, uh, even with these children who need that extra support and, and, and those parents that need that extra support. Thank you for making time to be, to be here. Uh, Kezia, uh, parting shots. Kezia, uh, your parting shot, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Nzeri, uh, for the opportunity to be here today. It's been quite a blessing. And uh, as I said, no one knows everything. The most we can do is accept we don't know, learn, relearn, strategize, relearn. <laughs> so keep your learning heart on. And I pray that God orders your steps in everything. You're doing a good job as parents, uh, as non-parents. I am one who is not yet a parent, but have been privileged to take care of other people's children. So don't tire to learn and relearn, even through this transition. You're doing a good job. Be kind to yourself. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Kezia, for for such powerful insights and sharing with us in the presentation and making sure we are that much more prepared and uh, build resilience necessary for such transitions. And last but not least, uh, over to you, mom, man, mom, Ted. Uh, you're gonna get used to it, man, mom. <laughs> um, repurpose, refocus, re-energize. I'll say that again, repurpose refocus, re-energize. Always make sure that the self that you are is a self that you're happy with. The thing that you're doing is the, the thing that you're happy with. Because what I was doing 10 years ago, if you asked me to do today, I wouldn't want to do it. Um, don't get stuck in a rat race. It's not about a rat race. It's about really rediscovering your purpose, re-energizing yourself and refocusing and regrouping, making sure you're in a space that enables you to be the best person that you can be. At the end of the day, yes, we do love our children to bits, but if we are broken vessels, we can't love on those children good enough. So we must always make sure that we take care of self. Self is very, very important. Repurpose, refocus re-energize. 
God bless everyone. And thank you so, so very much for this opportunity. And thank you as well, Ted. I'll get the hang of it, man, mom. Uh, with time yes. and 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 a and great job you're doing a joker job great job you're doing with your daughter such an inspiration to all of us and keep up the good work now to all of us i want to take this opportunity to thank you for honoring us with your presence i hope you have learned i have learned a lot a lot from all our panelists today and our commitment as britam remains one we are with you every step of the way and we mean exactly that because we know that life is, will change, but we will be there even at that stage. And we'll be able to make that transition with you at that stage. And I want to say that 2020 started with quite a few adjustments and we learned a lot. And we learned that life truly has ups and downs. And to make it through, we need to ride the waves of transition sustainably. Most importantly, we need to ensure that we and our children go through it well. And as I've said, Britam remains here. We are with you every step of the way. And even during COVID, we even went a step further and said, it's a step at a time. Let's take this a step at a time. Our children remain our most important asset. All we do is geared towards ensuring that they have a secure and successful future. So even as we go into our upcoming episode, remember this is a four-part series. We just did our second webinar as part of education planning with Britam. Our next one will be investing in the present and in the future, where we will be delving a lot more into this children's um, future and how to plan for that and prepare for that financially, making sure the children have the resources at the right time to ensure you're able to lock in the best education in the future for your child. Look out for the dates for that and, and we'll be posting them there on our social media pages and also communicating to you once you're ready. Otherwise, thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you next time. This webinar remains on our YouTube uh, page. Uh, you can always click on it and uh, be able to review uh, the video. Uh, and other than that, stay safe and God bless.